<laughs> Welcome back. Yes. To Market Mondays. Glorious Monday it is. Um, yes, it is. Beautiful. A day. lot to a lot to cover. We finally broke a heat wave. Yeah, for sure. It was sure. blazing out here, man. Yes. Sersky. Yeah. Um so um yeah, man, this is this is uh you know the dog days of summer. It's the it's the last Monday of July, it's the 31st of July. And teacher world, that is like damn, school is here. Right around the corner. School is here. Like they start in school like next week down south. That's what we call the dog. No, they start school tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. That's crazy. Oh, today. today. Today was the first. Yeah, school, I thought yeah. they I thought usually they, they, they start the first Monday in August. Yeah, they I think some schools started today. This is yeah. So um <laughs> so, going by so fast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We don't start school up here until the end until after yeah, after Labor Day. Labor Day. So yep, like yep. the second week in September. But um yeah, the dog days of summer. That's what they call it. Mm-hmm. Um so we are we are pushing through. Yes, and, um, we we are getting it done. Dope episode comes out tomorrow. Calais Campbell, oh my God, um, NFL legend, and uh, very good dude. We did it during the Super Bowl, and we've been holding on to that for a while. But um, he's a uh, he's one of those ones, man. Very interested in business and investing. He played in the league for like fifteen years, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's yes. still and he's still playing. Um, so you know, just an all around good dude talking about NFL football. Um, life after football, investing, business, all kinds of different stuff. So yeah. that was one of the ones that we did during Super Bowl. Thank you to the NFL PA for setting that up. Yeah, he was a uh, he used to play for the Cardinals, which is kind of like every time we walked anywhere with him, everybody stopped him. Like, Calais, we love you. Uh, and he he was I think last season he was playing with the Ravens. I think he's a free agent right now though. So uh, salute to him, man. Just a smart dude on and off the field. And shout out to Humble. That's his best dude. friend. His- <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Yeah, they grew up together. Oh, that's dope. His that's best dope. friend, but that that is a it, that is a sitcom in itself. Those two together are hilarious, yeah, man. man. Humble's a special dude. Shout out to him and shout out to my boy Tony. Ladies and gentlemen, the time has come. Yes. Market Mondays. We are headed overseas. Um, we are going to Ghana. And we will yes. be announcing the Chicago. They look to the Chicago next week. Um, if we can, we got the date. We got the date. Uh, we have the date, but I'm gonna let's release the okay, tickets okay. and all that. Yeah, yeah. So let's make that a priority to make sure we can get that done because I know mm-hmm. people are asking. But um, Ghana, December 27th in the motherland. Yes. Market Mondays live mm-hmm. outside mm-hmm. treehouse. Yes. Accra. Yes. It's gonna happen. It's gonna happen, ladies and gentlemen. So get your tickets. Get your hotels. Get your all of that. Um vitally important that you come and if you're going to be in ghana already because it's going to be a bunch of people there already add this to your itinerary click the link in the bio and get your tickets this is like the kickoff to the celebration of what happens in accra every december everything happens after market mondays live which is dope uh so we're gonna set it off the right way and then we'll be part of i'm sure some festivities that are happening in the following days so pull up Pull up, get your itineraries ready. It's going to be more than just us going to the continent itself. I know it's going to be a lot of people's first time. It's going to be a magical moment, man. Spending New Year's in a different country, mm-hmm. spending it in Accra, uh, in Ghana specifically, which means so much to our community across the diaspora. Magical, 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 man. Make sure y'all are here. More fire, bro. What better way to end the year and start your year than to be with us, knowing what to invest in for 2024? Uh, end of year called NVIDIA to be stock of the year at Market Mondays in Ghana. I will call my stock for 2024. Be there or be square. That's Love a y'all. fact. That's a fact, though. All right. Uh, any Yeah. Disclaimer? All right, let's do the disclaimer. You know how this works. Do your own research. Our content is intended to be used. It must be used for informational purposes only. It's very important to do your own analysis before making any investment based on your own personal circumstances. You should take independent financial advice from a professional in connection with or independently research and verify any information that you find on our show and wish to rely upon whether for the purpose of making an investment decision or otherwise. This is a message brought to you by the good brothers at Earn Your Leisure and the good brother Ian Dunlap, the master investor himself. Please continue to do your own research. Yes. When it's great research, share it. When you found it with somebody else, give them credit. That's how we build community, y'all. Love is love. Ian, any announcements? Yes, I want to say happy uh, belated birthday to my brother, John. Um, Go to joinredpanda.com for those of you who are looking for the renewal link for Stock Club. And shout out to my guy, Fijian, uh, 24-year-old Red Panda member. He started with 30K and in 14 months grew it to 73,000. If I made you money, please put a yes in chat. 
Um, shout out to everybody who's been executing, um, getting gains, and shout out to Joe Budden for having me on uh, this <laughs> podcast briefly. And, and here's a funny thing, too. You ever notice all the people who be like, you will never work in this town again. Don't control anything in the town. <laughs> So shout out to I, Ally and all my allies out there. Love you. <laughs> hey, you know what we got a shout out? You, my brother. Thank you. Can we put a birthday cake in the chat? Tomorrow is Ian's birthday. You thought we was gonna go throughout the show without mentioning that, my brother. Happy birthday to you, 82 baby. Thank more you. blessings, more life to you for Thank everything you. that you do for the community, for the brotherhood that you've shown with us. Shout yeah. out to Mike on the graphics. <laughs> shout out to Mike. I appreciate you. <laughs> Pulling in overtime. Love is love, my guy. Happy birthday to Ian, man. Enjoy your day. Definitely Enjoy will. your day. We're going to see you this weekend in, in Carabana. Oh, click the link in the bio. Yeah. Um, we throwing a we throwing a networking event in Carabana on Monday. Um, and it's free and it's, it's vibes. Um, all you got to do is RSVP. So Canada will be up there all weekend. Um, show your love. Yes. And um, we gonna we gonna we gonna get it rocking. And I got to give a big shout out to our Revolt family yes. Assets Over Liabilities yes. Season 3 oh, that one tonight tonight, tonight. tonight on, on TV and then um, the YouTube version comes out on Wednesday. Shout out to the whole team at Revolt. Shout out to Dion and um, the whole entire team over there man and of course Diddy who will be at Invest Fest. Yes. Greatly appreciate that and um, you, you know yeah. that's through relationships. I want to talk about networking and stuff a little later on but um you know you even tell me who we kicking the season off with swiss beats yes swiss beats please come on what's Legend. up brother yo two years in the making check that out man. two I years in the making i've been working on this for a long time shout out to swiss man shout out yeah. to swiss shout out to the whole revolt team michelle and atra yeah. I mean, good people lisa man. appreciate y'all good people for sure all right so let's get into this um interest rates hit the highest level in 22 years. My Lord. What does this mean for us as consumers? Um, unfortunately, the prices of everything is going to go up. Uh, we'll talk about the real estate pending bubble that we have with uh, real estate rental prices being so high. But for those of us who are old enough to remember, this may not be the end. Um, I remember a time where if you had like a 580 credit score, if you paid for a mortgage, um, your interest rates could be 12 or 11 percent. I hope that we don't go that high. Um, the Fed's been pretty clear in their plan for the last year and a half about what they want to do. Um, but I'm seeing people are starting to get a little bit worried. We talked about it before. The average payment is $790 for a new car. The rental market is going up. Mortgages are going up. Uh, everything is just going to cost more. So we have to be a lot more effective in our planning and our spending as interest rates go up. Yeah. So, I mean, for consumers, like you just said, car loans are going to cost more. Mm -hmm. Credit cards are going to, the debt's going to be, the interest rates are going to be higher and mortgage rates are going to be higher. That's what it means, right? Straight up. That's what this yep. means with the interest rates uh, being raised. But on the other side, well, there's another thing that it means. It means that we're further away from 2%, which is what Fed Chair Powell has been saying. Like they want to get back to 2%, but as we keep raising and keep raising, and hopefully they think like this will be there'll be a pause in September, if not, maybe a quarter. And then it's going to be depending on the economic data, which is showing that it may stop. We'll get to five and a half percent and mm -hmm. it'll stop there, which is further. But on the bright side, if there is one, does that mean and I'll pose this question, does that mean where recession is off the table? Because that's what you know, that that's the other part of this. Right. As the interest rates get higher, economic data is showing that, you know what? There might be a chance for a soft landing, and maybe we don't go into a recession, which could cause a catastrophic event. I think mm -hmm. they already announced that a recession is, is not going to happen this year. Mm -hmm. um, so most economic analysts um, are in agreement that we probably will not see a recession. So then where we well, when we talked about this in February, when we were saying, all right, by definition, this should be right. Two negative quarters does equal a recession. Mm -hmm. Do we have to now change what the definition is for a recession? Right. Because did it really feel like one? Because this might have been the bullish recession we've ever seen. I think they changed it to fit the narrative that was good at the time. So like if a triple double is nine points, nine rebounds and nine steals, <laughs> Jason Kidd may have the all time record. Like I think they adjusted it for what was convenient for them to prevent panic. 
I don't think we should change the definition. I think this would be like the Balco era of investing where it's like, hey, this one just didn't count, um, which is interesting in itself. And as interest rates go up, it slows down spending for a lot of people. Um, if you ask anyone as we're out and about, I don't think people feel more confident in their financial situation more so now than they did two years ago. So mm -hmm. I don't know how they keep saying that the economy is in such a great place when interest is going up. Like even like for let's say if you can rent a four bedroom in New York, what's the cost to rent that in New York now? Eight thousand dollars. But you know what's so crazy is like going back to the eye test. Um, you know, I was talking to more shout out to more, and we were just having a conversation from D Mall. Yeah, from Roy okay. and Moore. Shout to Moore. Um, money we, bags in chat. And we was talking, and I was having this conversation. Money bags. No recession for him. <laughs> it's a fact. I, was talking, I had this conversation with a few different people about um, the luxury apartment buildings in New York. It's interesting dynamic was happening here. Um, these luxury apartment buildings in New York, and I've seen it happen in Atlanta as well, where they're starting to look like the trap house. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, <laughs> run down, oh, right? Not even that. It's just like you see a bunch of people just in a lobby hanging out outside. A lot of dancers are moving in. And I'm like, yo, what ballerinas? Yeah. That's a sign um, of recession. Is it? Because I was, oh, talk, I was, I was like, because I was talking to like yesterday. And going, I, I, I'm going. like, yo, what are you? And they're like, yo, it's a lot of money out here. Okay. A lot of people getting money. This is this is this is what I'm getting to. Because I'm like, there can't be that many because they have different programs to get people in. But I'm like, everybody here can't be on a program. So how is every how is these? And this it's not just one building. Mm -hmm. It's a trend that's happening. And he was like, yo, it's a lot of money out here. So, so that's that. So that's what I'm getting to, right? Like, if we look at consumer spending, it's pretty strong. So at some point, when is it not going to be strong? And as far as like from a enterprise side, like at some point. Even when we look at some of these earnings, and we we expected growth to slow down, right? Yeah. We expected revenue to be cut back, especially in the second half of this year. But when we looked at the the reporting from the second quarter, we're not seeing that. So, at what point will we see the effects of the interest rates being raised? Is it the second half of twenty twenty four? Is it twenty twenty five's first quarter? Like at some point, when will we see the effects? Because I mean, you raise interest rates, it's going to take time for it to to kick in. But like to Shadi's point. People are still spending, and this isn't like PPP anymore. Like this is something different. Yeah. Let me run off two stats real quick. Um, yeah. Forty-nine percent of people in the U.S. with equity um, has uh, the equity is worth less than it was two years ago. Pre-pandemic, it was twenty-seven percent, and eighty-three point five percent of people ages twenty-five to fifty-four are looking for work, which is two point two million more than COVID. The truth is, like it'll start to be shown after whoever wins the next election. For whatever reason, um, there's a lot of fear that if this is announced before uh, the next election, that Biden will be thrown out of office. And mm -hmm. I can totally understand why. The Republicans don't want Trump to get back in. The Republican Party's in shambles and who they want to, to lead. DeSantis is having trouble. They don't want to back RFK. They don't want Trump. The Democrats are stuck with Biden and Hunter having fun in the White, uh, White House office. So it's a shit show across the political landscape in terms of like the presidential race. But I think after the new president is announced, then we'll start to see what the real data is and how things are really going. And yes, actually, that stripper indicator for the ratio of strippers that buy homes and properties is an actual index to look at. Yeah, it, it, it really is. So and I know it's a lot of people get money, but it's a lot of people who are out, out here hurting and. Um, I don't think that they're telling a real story about the economy of what's going on. And I think after the election, the truth will start to come out slowly but surely. Yeah. I mean, well, inflation numbers have gone down, right? I mean, from what you're speaking to, the un unemployment rate, from what we've seen, it's been pretty low mm -hmm. to a certain point. So, I mean, it's kind of consistent, right? If I'm, if they're saying like the first quarter of 2025, then that would be after the presidential cycle, right? Because the president will be elected in 24 of November. Yep. Then they'll go into office in 25. So maybe that is consistent and we'll, we will see that, right? Because who wants to have that on their tenure, on their resume? There was a recession during your term, right? Especially yeah. if you're trying to be reelected, that definitely is not going to help. Shadi, um, yeah, it's a point I know you want to bring up, so I don't want that to be left out. Um, yeah, well, I, I feel like, you know, it's a few different things that's happening. It's interesting because, yeah, there are people that are struggling, but 
the economy itself is still healthy. Um, the stock market is booming. As you said, unemployment is, is down reasonably. Inflation has come down. The housing market is still high. You That's know, it, it, it kind of slumped a little bit, but it's, it hasn't fallen off a cliff. And it's still places like Miami where it's just going crazy. Miami is at a point. That's I don't insane. know how it can. Like Miami is at a point now where it, it's unstoppable. And the way that they're developing, it's going to look like my it's going to look like Manhattan in, in five years. Like the development that's happening in Miami and the, the money that's flowing into Miami right now is just unbelievable. And there's still places like New York where real estate is still high and rents are still high and people are still living. And Drake set up a whole residency in New York. I've never really seen anything like that. He was in New York for two weeks doing mm-hmm. six shows. He sold out yeah. Madison Square Garden. I don't know why he just didn't do arenas. Seven, seven, seven. But, shows. um, well, he did four in Barclay, three in, in the garden. But that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, that's unprecedented. Like, he set up shop in, do, in new york to do harry styles the 15 in a row well, yeah, why absolutely. Not? Was, right. they put a those, banner up for this those dude. tickets are not cheap they're not a, they are not twelve hundred dollars two thousand and he's selling out every single night yeah so there's different things that's happening with this economy where i don't think that it's to the point where you know is extremely bad yeah that they did an interesting report on that like and this is why and I had this talk about Live Nation, because they were looking at that, the economic yep. impact that some of these these tours are having on these cities and the economy in general. Right. When you got Taylor Swift, who's doing her world tour and it's in the United States and it's boosting the economy of each city that she's in. Beyonce's doing the world tour. And now she's in America doing it. And she's boosting the economy right from a travel standpoint, from a hospitality standpoint and from the revenue that's being in. Brought into the arenas or the stadiums that they because they I shouldn't say arenas they're doing stadium tours and the taxes yeah. that are being so these things are helping as well. I talked about the weekend before about what he's doing and you just mentioned Drake. So like all these tours happening, they're helping from a certain standpoint. I know it's a small piece. I think they brought in like five billion dollars over the course of uh, the end of June and and July. This is which is a, a large amount, but to the economy, which is like over was it seventy trillion. Yeah, it it plays a part in it. It plays its part in it. Yeah. For sure. it, it definitely does. And I think uh, got to give Joe credit. Um, he said that in a couple of years that a going to concerts will be like a super luxury item. And we're getting there now. Like the like drink tickets are not cheap. Taylor Swift isn't cheap. When we tried to go to that uh, Harry Styles concert last year, I think the tickets was twenty five hundred and couldn't get tickets. He was sold out every date possible to be able to go. So I think um, those that are doing well. Are continuing to do well, but those who are not doing well and those that have the, that have been lost the last four or five years, I think this gap and the disparity is becoming so wide that it's going to be hard to make up for it in a few years. That's my concern. Yes, of course, there's always going to be people um, who make money. They're going to be high earners. Uh, it's that eighty twenty rule. Like twenty percent of the people are going to make an exorbitant amount of money. Eighty percent is not. But I'm worried about that gap being so wide. With uh rising rent, even here in Houston, like there's a lot of people who moved to Houston because it was considered affordable, and now a lot of them are also being priced out. So I think the gap is a story that isn't being told. And every company seems to be adjusting to going the luxury route or premium pricing, which I've always been pro. But the lower end companies, I was reading an article earlier, Amazon and Walmart are now expounding, excuse me, expanding to India as well, following the footsteps of Apple. Xander say, say, and congrats on your win. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think India's economy is raising up and it's filling in that middle class gap that we lost. And we're really a luxury good, luxury service kind of market now. And it's going to be bad for a lot of people. All right. Well, we'll monitor the situation um, and see for sure. Yeah. So let's talk about stocks, shall we? Mm-hmm. Um, City. And other analysts are predicting a year-end target of 4,600 for the S&P 500. Um, do you agree with this price, or do you have another year-end price target for the S&P? And that's really just staying flat because it's at <laughs> 4,582 now <laughs> around that you know, yeah. price. So it's almost it's at it's at 4,600 now, pretty much re- realistically. So um, it's saying that it's going to get 4,600. By the end of the year, is is you know there's actually actually no growth. Yeah. So, what's your price target for the S and P five hundred for the rest of the year? 
Yeah, I think we'll top out like at 48.83. Like that's where resistance is, is looking like uh, it'll be at. And as long as they keep printing, it was really telling to see like how much institutions got behind NVIDIA like after it got hot, even though like the P ratio was so wide. You, a traditional institution would not invest at that point, but then they had to pile in money to get those gains. It seems like it's one of those years where, kind of like in ball, like they're letting the players play. Um, and when we should be slowing down a little bit, we aren't. So like 4,800 is like really the top. So I think we'll end around like 47, 50, 47, 75, somewhere around there. Because I, I highly doubt that we'll stay flat. We should pull back some next month, but October and November, I think will be great. Um, Because also on the institutional side, you don't want to go into a holiday season reporting that you're down because your clients are going to leave or rotate to another fund. And that's a lot more important than like sector rotation, which is like client rotation. The first and fourth quarters are the ones that matter the most. So they can sustain like a potential down third quarter and then end up. But I think we'll be like north of 4,700 by end of year. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a pretty good number. If we look at it. And we gotta put things into context, right? That the the number that is at now, that what'd you say, the forty eight, the forty six, yeah, like forty five, ninety two, something like that. Yeah, that's the highest that it's been since April of last year. So that's a nineteen percent gain, right? Mm -hmm. And year to date, nineteen percent gain. That's a pretty incredible. Um, that's a lot for an index. <laughs> for an index, that's a, that's to, a lot to grow nineteen percent. So that we just gotta keep that in context. And then when we look at it from the standpoint of the rest of the year. And I see a lot of analysts saying the same thing. It's like, how much higher can we go? Are we going to see another 19% gain? Probably not likely, mm -mm. right? But could we see a 6% gain from this point on? It's possible. It's poten the, the potential is there, which is more realistic. Now, even if we look at it, and that's why we always talk about we have to be very mindful of percentages, right? We can't mm -hmm. sneeze at a 6% gain. That's an amazing game for it, especially for an index. When you take into account that it's already been up 19%, you're talking about a 25% gain for the year. Go back in the history and look how many times that the S and P has risen twenty five percent in a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? and the last that, time. We, my bad. Go ahead. That, that'll give you historical context about where you're at and how much of a of a opportune time this was over the past six months to be investing in the market. That's why we, you know, we always try to say, "What wasn't a good time? Was a good time? Today is a good time." Yeah, and, and normally after we end flat, if we are in a recession, we normally go up for like three years straight and then have a little pullback. Um, we pulled back in twenty eighteen. It was flat. The 19, 20, and 21 was amazing. 22, we slid down, and now we're back to the upside. So it's just following that same like macro trend of being up. And this is the number one reason why I always say, like, don't try and time the market. And it's better just to have money in the market working for you, opposed to you just trying to be in every trade and try and time it. Because that's what ultimately, we're here to get wealthy. If you're here to get wealthy, please put wealthy in chat. Um, you have to have the money working for you while you're sleeping. Because Im imagine if you got out of the market last year, and thought Apple, Microsoft, AMD, NVIDIA, Google was going to fall apart, and it's on a historic run, you have to keep your money flowing in the market for you no matter what. For sure. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, we'll monitor the S&P and see how high it goes, uh, or if we have a pullback and a buying opportunity that may potentially happen. But Yeah, and pullbacks happen every month, but the probability of it going flat or negative for the year and uh, damn near impossible and the S robert kiyosaki is going to tell you otherwise but it's not true <laughs> and the s p 500 for anybody that doesn't know that standard and poor's 500 is 500 companies that are used as a microcosm for the stock market and the index fund is what they call it and that kind of is um used as an indicator if the market is up or the market is down so they're not talking about every single stock on the stock market they're usually talking about the dow jones or the russell 2000 or the s p 500 and I think the s p 500 is the most reliable index yeah. that most people use to gauge yeah. um you know stocks as a whole yeah for anybody that's new to the show that might not know what the s p 500 is so let's switch gears a little bit um, if your brand wasn't where it is today, uh, what would your blueprint be to 10 X your business at InvestVest? Yeah, that's crazy. We're almost a, a month away. Jesus time is flying. Um, but number one, I would map out the hundred people that I want to meet and have a specific plan for what I want to help them with. Um, number two, for everyone's attending in the general audience, like I will look to target three to 5,000 people 
talk to them, find a way to come up to them and say, hey, I'm going to help you. Like, and even like my friends will tease me all the time. Like every show you have to be pulled off the stage. But my thing is every show, I never know who's who. There are some people that have tremendous value. Um, that's how I met Christian at CAA. Shout out to him. Like uh, some of the people that I've met that I've built relationships with, I didn't know who they were, but I stayed longer and after like the first London meetup, I you know had to be drug out of. Um, so I, I will find a way to, to find 3,000 or 5,000 people to say, hey, my thing is going to be, hey, can I help you make money for free? That's literally going to be my pay. Y'all going to see me in the hallways and by the exhibits and saying, hey, can I help you make money? Because you still have to have some face-to-face -face time with people so people can understand if they can trust you. And then if you have a booth, which I will have, go to every person at a booth and find a way to bring them business. My number one thing, after I get a crowd that first day, like I did the first year at InvestFest, I'm going to be sending my people to other people's booths because it's easier to build a business relationship with somebody if you have made the money. So, number one. Well, even when y'all saw y'all put up Jermaine Dupree, I'm like, damn, I didn't even know about that one. Like, who else y'all got coming? Tupac <laughs> gonna be at Invest Fest. <laughs> <laughs> Tupac, <man>. um, Jesus. <laughs> so I'm like, find a way to meet the people that you want to meet, actually spend time in a crowd, and then for the vendors, because every vendor who was there, their dream was to walk away with, I don't know, 3X, 10X, 15X sales. But if you can facilitate them making money and making sales. You may not be able to have a conversation that Friday, Saturday, Sunday, but for damn sure that Monday, they're going to call you and say thank you. So that's my uh, three-step blueprint that I'm going to be implementing for this year's Invest Fest. What about you? Yeah, that, those are those are three great keys. Um, and we saw this in Detroit. Um, and I, The young lady's name is slipping my mind, but when we walked into the event uh, with Ally, um, she had a, a card. And the card, it wasn't a business card. It was a how-to network in these type of events card and That's it gave fire people, yo it, it was like a 10-step thing that you should be doing um and so like those are three things but i'm sure there's people that can add more to it but mm -hmm. a lot of people are like coaching in business like these are opportunities right like you can show your worth right now you can show your value and when she handed it to us i was like oh i looked at her i'm like oh, this is pretty great but yeah, even after the event we got to sit down and talk with her about the city of detroit and got to really understand what she does and like she has like six or seven businesses and like Yo, I haven't seen this yet, but this is this is pretty dope. So I think she's actually going to be at InvestFest. I think she's coming down with with the tools of how to network inside these events, how to add value, how to bring business to people, how to network, especially because a lot of people get in spaces and they get intimidated. Yeah, right. Gotta be like, fearless. I I know I want to tell something to Ian, but I see him there. What am I supposed to even say now that he's in my presence? I don't even know what to do. And this is this is a part of it. So these these are such, like simple tools that you can use and help you. It's a guide for you to to actually implement it. And even if you don't speak to an Ian, right, there might be somebody in there that can add just as much value um, to you, the business that they they have at hand. So yeah, always come prepared for these type of situations. When I saw that, I'm like, that's spot on. I love that. Uh, yeah, I think best practices is um, know where you want to go. So there'll be a schedule of, of like different panels. So, you know, OK, I want to go to the AI panel. I want to go to the investment panel, like kind of map that out beforehand. Yeah. Um, I would map out time to go to the vendor marketplace for sure, because that's where all of the networking really happens. Um, I would be sure to support the vendors um, because that's great conversations as well. Just, Absolutely. you know, having conversations with different business owners. Um, I would definitely have uh, information readily available. I would. This is what I talked about before as far as the uh, special moments that I, I saved on my phone. I, I gave this talk before, but, you know, I was meeting different people from, you know, Diddy to whatever. And I would just show them like, you know, this is what we did when we was in Madison Square Garden. This is what we did when we was in Royal Lava Hall. And I would have to like go through Instagram to try to find the video. And it was taking a lot of time. So I realized that I can show you better than I can explain to you. Yeah. And videos are a great way to just show somebody something visually. So I put together an album in my phone called, um, I forgot what it's called, like historical moments or something like that. And it's like Madison Square Garden, it's Invest Fest, it's Royal Albert Hall. And it's just like 60 second videos that just show the crowd, just, you know, highlight the, the event. And now that I can pull that up within seconds. So now when I go to meet somebody and I'm telling them about you know, what we do, and instead of me just talking to them for an hour, I'm like, you know, look, we sold out Royal Albert Hall. Look here, here's a video, and they when they see it, it's like, oh wow, like that's crazy. Yeah. So um, that's something that's been extremely beneficial for me 
when in the networking process, but you should always have your, 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 your information ready. Like they used to say, like, have your elevator speech ready at all times. You still should have an elevator speech ready at all times. The reason why they call it elevator speech is if you're in an elevator with somebody, you might have 10 seconds or 15 seconds, right? Mm -hmm. So you should be able to explain what you do and get them interested within that 15, 30 seconds. So, but you should also have, you know, a deck readily available. Somebody might just say, email me. All right, well, what's your email? All right, I'm going to send it to you right now. So I don't right forget. You know, yep. Have some client management system in place. That's another thing. So many times when you go to events like InvestFest, you meet so many different people and you never follow up with anybody because you get so many numbers, you get so many emails, you get so many business cards. You have to have a system in place where you can filter this. Some people are top priority. Some people are mid-level priority. Some people are just not priority at all. Yep. But it's become overwhelming if you if you can't filter it properly. So there's different client management systems that you can actually utilize um, to actually, you know, make sure that you're implementing systems in place to properly reach out to people. Like when I was a financial advisor, I used to have something in place where I was meet somebody and then it gives me a reminder in two days to reach out to them. Then it gives me a reminder in a week to follow up like so many people, 90% of the people never call. And then the other 8% of the people don't follow up. So like 90% of the people that get a number won't call. Absolutely. And then 8%, which brings it to 98%, will send one communication. They'll send one email, one text, and then they won't follow up. Only 2% are actually persistent enough to follow up. That is extremely vital. It makes a lot of difference. So it's a, it's a, you know you gotta have a whole segment on on this because it's, it's it's important to um I mean not just invest fest for any anywhere that you go like anywhere that you go you 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 might meet somebody networking is is a science it's not something that you can just um wing mm -hmm. it, you have to be extremely um intentional with what you're trying to do mm -hmm, and who mm -hmm. you're trying to meet because to me I said this over and over again you're gonna learn so much stuff at invest fest that's a given but. To me, the real value, bigger than just the information that you get, is the relationships that you, you, you get. You're going to meet somebody mm -hmm. that is going to change your life or can change your life. It's almost impossible not to. What's the odds? Yeah. If, it, if it's 20,000 people, you don't think you're going to meet one person? That's impossible. Mm -hmm. So it's like, all right, now, where where do I go? Where do I sit? Am I in VIP? Am I, am I on the perimeter? Am I in state? Like, different things you got to just think about strategically before before yeah. you actually go so you can have a, a roadmap. And then things are going to happen. But even the nightlife. When we were in Davos, the one of the most beneficial things was the nightlife. You got to pop out. Yeah, going to these random little bars. And, and there's so much stuff that will be happening in the city of Atlanta that weekend where from the, the bars, the networking events after – the clubs, yeah. whatever, like, you know, you got to be out and about and yeah. different things. And when, you, when you're when you in, and I want to ask you about, you know, Kathy Wood, what you feel about that. But I always had a great conversation. We announced that she was going to be there. The internet just went crazy. Yeah, and, went uh, crazy. 19 Keys, me and 19 Keys had a great conversation. He was just saying, like, you know, I don't think people really realize, like, you know, the magnitude of, of this. Like, you know, when you bring people at the highest level of business in the world, right? Yep. Like real, real billionaire people that's managing $50 billion. Like when you bring people like that together, when you got a Mike Novogratz, Kathy Wood, uh, uh, you know, uh, Rich Paul, uh, uh, Don Peoples III, uh, Robert F. Smith, when you had just, it's a frequency that's created. Absolutely. That, that, and it's like, that's, that's the power of Davos. Like you have that many people together Random things just happen. You just get a hundred million dollar, you know, grant. You just do just crazy, crazy stuff happens. It's a frequency. And um, Key's whole thing was, you know, he was like, you know, just to have somebody like her, he was like, just to actually be able to get her is crazy, but to have her and then have her speak, and then the opportunities that that creates absolutely other people that's next to her, that's sitting next to her, that's on panels and different. He was like, sometimes people don't even fully understand. Like he was like, this is bigger than just like, you know, I'm at an event or I'm speaking at an event just to have an opportunity to be in a room and to be affiliated and to be close to, this is not something that's normal. And it's not something that it's just, you can just do randomly. Like you just can't, like, you know what I mean? Yeah, so it it's, takes a lot of work. That's why I say yeah. Jermaine, Diddy, Robert, Kath, like the lineup you have, it norm you ha normally have to go to five conferences to see all those people. 
Or if they go to a conference, they're not giving their all. Like yeah. when Steven Titus spoke last year, they were talking from their soul. They didn't come at the last minute and just throw some stuff up. Um, and that's one of the things that Keys and I always talk about. Because I always tell them, go on stage and kill, kill everybody, including me. But always to be prepared. Because like you said, you don't know what opportunity mm -hmm. is going to be there. But like you said, the frequency. But my first thought is, what can we do to help them more? Like, I stop me if I need to. But my first thought was like, what can we do to get rich? And Robert and Diddy and Kathy and us together to help in every business. Great. Trust has already been built. All right, let's dance. Let's have fun. D did he have some issues with Diageo? Let's see how we can fix that. Let's see how I can help Kathy. Let's see how we can help Rich. If I need to bring my above the rim bandana tomorrow, let me know. <laughs> right? But it's how can you get in the room and help? I know a lot of times people want to be on stage. But even for me, like the reason why I'm able to be on the stage and thanks for having me for the third year um, is the people I've been able to help. Yeah, the information is fire, but if it didn't turn into actual money for people, it wouldn't mean anything. So now it's like, okay, how can we help Jay-Z or Beyonce while still helping the people and help Rich and Diddy and Drake and whoever else? Like, that's what it's really about. But that frequency is really important, like you say. No, no, um, and that's what Keys, he was like, yo, he's like, He's like, I don't, he's like, I wouldn't want to not be affiliated with this. He's like, I, he's like, I know, like, he's like, I, I personally don't see any value in not being affiliated. <laughs> he's like, I just don't see it. He's like, cause it's just only good things can come from this from, from a pure selfish standpoint, right? Absolutely. It's like, I wouldn't want to not be affiliated, but I want to ask you about Kathy mm -hmm. because, um, you know, we've covered her a lot in ARC funds. And I, I say, I put this on Twitter where this is a, this is, she's a case of, keeping your composure mm -hmm. and sticking to your guns. And, you know, she was hailed as the greatest investor of our generation during the pandemic when ARC was going crazy. And then when ARC fell, she was getting arrows and everybody was, you know, throwing her under the bus. And yeah. not everybody, but a lot of people were throwing her under the bus. And it was, you know, she was terrible and she made this bad decision. She made that bad decision. And a lot of sideline coaching going on. And um, she kept her composure. Mm -hmm. And they're back, you know, up 40% for the year. So for and people like it's when you're managing billions of dollars, you can't take the same risk as a retail investor. So you got to be extremely safe. So, yeah. I mean, 40% is great for anything, but I just don't want people to discount it. Like, well, you know, I'm up 73% on, on my yeah. NVIDIA trade, I, but it's like you got $10,000. That's different from managing 50 billion. You, you, you can't, you can't take the same risk. It's a lot of different variables, but regardless how you feel about it, she's, um, obviously has $50 billion on the assets on the management. She knows mm -hmm. what she's doing and people trust her. And she's a legend in Wall Street for sure. And um, the most successful, most famous female investor ever in history. Um, she's, all, she's obviously knowledgeable. Do you agree with every single thing that she does? Probably not, but yeah. she's obviously I, knowledgeable. I, I think that part is, is fair to say. Do we have to agree with everything she does? Can we be critical of the things she does? Of course, we're just looking at it from, but like you said, her track record, certifies her as a legend but also warrants her the level of respect that she deserves right like she's not just in this position for no reason right like people have watched they watch that art fund and they've watched some of the the, the funds that have come inside of that on the umbrella and they say all right well uh, that move right there I don't, i'm not really sure tesla's down 40 percent, and you're buying a hundred thousand more shares and she's just going off of her merits and her beliefs inside of the the fund that she's created right mm -hmm. like that's not for us to understand, right? We're not at the level of expertise that she is, but we're just being objective of what's happening in the space, right? When we we saw Coinbase go down, it was like, well, why are you buying more? Or Roku. So we were looking at these individual entities and saying, all right, okay, I know we should buy the dip, but this thing is dipping and it's dipping and it's dipping. Yeah. But she's not in it for the one year. She's not in it for the two year. She's in it for longevity. And that's one of the things, I, I, I Ian, I know you, you like to stress as well. Like they're planning for... 10, 20, 50, in 100 years in advance. And so we got to have to have that type of mindset when we look at investing, right? Like, yeah, ARC was incredible in 2020. It didn't perform well in 2021, 2022. The entire NASDAQ went down and she has a lot of exposure to tech companies. So yeah, yeah. it took a hit as well. Is it, we're starting to see it climb. We obviously with, you know, Tesla was leading a lot of the funds. And so Tesla, has climbed and so it's going to help the fund climb but we got to have that mindset where we're not looking at it from a two to three year span especially when you're dealing with this amount of money right 50 billion yeah. that's nothing to sneeze at 
I mean, my first thought was um, when you guys told me, I was like, okay, this is fire. Um, but I always think that criticism without creating a solution is hating. So, like, of course, I was, like, critical of her. Now, my, my main thesis was they were going to attack her because I remember watching her on CNBC a few years prior, and they literally laughed her off of the stage on the show. And then Tessa goes on a crazy run. And I've experienced it myself. Like, you'll make an amazing call, and then there's a lot of people who want to attack you. But my first thing was, what if, like, two tech, two index was implemented or an institutional version of that to help it rise higher? Like, the thing that going back to Keith's point, ego is the biggest risk to your financial success more so than any trade that anybody can take. Because a lot of people keep always say, well, why don't you build another show or build something else? And I'm like, but if this was one is working and I'm here to invest and not be all in the videos, <laughs> dancing, shot to Diddy, why not focus on the main thing? Like some of the mistakes that Kathy made was probably too many trades, too many different funds. But I don't know if she had anyone in her corner saying, historically, this should not be done because not everyone who's on payroll always want to see you rise. So come in and be a solution. And that's my advice on a networking side. Always be a value add and be a help. But to have her um, on that stage, man, it's going to be an amazing conversation about how she you know, built it, how she created it. Um, the, some of the mistakes that she has made and how you guys can profit from them as well. But you're to date, I think. Well, you guys tell me, NVIDIA's done pretty well. Apple's done pretty well. Microsoft has been pretty well. If she's managing 50-50, and let's say hypothetically we formed a partnership and she had those two years ago, would that 50 now be at 150? That may yeah. be a conversation <laughs> that needs to be had. Yeah. Well, and it, that's the that's the that's the benefit yeah. of proximity. Can we can we Absolutely. just really quick can I say it? And without yeah. the partnership. Wouldn't have been able to happen. You'll, you'll be you'll be able to have the conversation. Yeah, and I think we when you speak about networking, and I got to give this gentleman a lot of credit. Our brother Caleb Silver. When you talk Ooh. about value add, Shout out to Caleb. when you talk about value add, this is a gentleman. I mean, he's been in this space for years, right? We even use Investopedia. I, I use it almost daily, yeah. right? Just so that you can have a clear understanding. Every time that we reach out to him. Or even when we don't, he'll just say like, yo, Troy, do you need anything? How can I help? How can I be of service? How can I be of service? So when InvestFest came and he said, how can I be of service? I'm like, yeah, I mean, of course, we want to have you part of it. He was part of InvestFest Europe. He's done a lot of things. He's been on Market Mondays. I said, here's some names. Let's see if, if you can get them. He said, Troy, this is too easy. I have, I have, we have relationships with these people. Yep. So Caleb was integral in, in this process of, of, of securing Kathy. But even after that, he was like, give me a, a harder challenge. I want to add more. If you need me to host a panel, if you need me to host VIP night, I'm willing to do it. If you need me to just mentor people, I'm willing to do that. And he doesn't have to do any of these Any things. of it. He doesn't, I was, I, I was, he doesn't have to do any, any of these things, but he sees value in what we're doing. He loves what we're doing. And he's like, guys. And this started, this relationship started three years ago. Like he came, yep. he came to, um, we came to a Zoom call. And the next week we had, stuff like merch that was sent to my house i'm like yo this guy's really serious about it yeah. and we've just kept that relationship man i watched this dude fly from a birthday party to come to london to do invest fest in, in europe yep. incredible dude so when we talk about networking and ad value this is a prime example of that shout out to our brother caleb silver shout man. out to caleb yeah I'm amazing sure. person good dude man and um yeah i'm looking forward to i'm looking forward to that it's yeah. gonna be legendary that was definitely something that he he uh he reached out to the team and they um <laughs> they were open to it Got it done. We'll Shout get out it to done. We get it done. We get it done. That's a fact. <laughs> He's one of those ones. Invest fast. A few more names to announce. Is loading. Get your tickets. Pre sale prices expire tonight. Yes. You got six hours, ladies and gentlemen. <sighs> I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm yes. excited. And for anybody who needs a VIP pass, if you wire me a hundred grand, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> So you say in the arc, the arc red panda collaboration? If not me, who? <laughs> I mean, who? Ooh, boss, <laughs> boss, <laughs> talking heavy. I mean, I like I that. Mean, Apple, Microsoft, <laughs> Nvidia, AMD. <laughs> if I'm comparing the games from Stock Club and just let's take it at, at face value, most people have been in three, been up since three for three years. It's up three hundred and fifteen percent to uh, to like two twenty on a low end. I don't know why your advisors and forewarn you. Mm. 
I'm just saying. So it looks like perfect sense. Hey, what do you know? <laughs> what do you what know? Do you know? Yeah. What do you know? All right. Um, I've only been on here for three years making every pro proclamation. I told you the dinosaurs were going to come back. The aliens are going to be here. All that came true. And then the only, people think, only thing people want to say, one L like me, he called Square. I also called NVIDIA and Bitcoin. And I was financially free when I got here. And we opened up a lane for others to be able to talk about this. See or no? <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, I'm just saying. For free. Open up the lane. <laughs> hey, if I've made you money, please put yes in chat. Collaboration over competition. That's a fact. We yes, know this we, is true. Uh -huh. yeah. And if you see somebody who's dope, ask Keys or whenever Keys come. Every time I see Keys, I'm like, bro, quit holding back. Go out there and kill me too. I don't leave me out of it. And then High Level came on. He sure did. Well, he came and just scorched the earth. <laughs> Look like a meteor hitting. Go and listen to Man. him and Billy's conversation about aliens and what they're talking about now. Nineteen billion million views fact. later. That's a fact. They got the aliens. They've they've announced the aliens. That was illmatic. <laughs> that was hey. illmatic. Think about it. All right, let's and, talk. And about the interesting how. part when they announced the aliens being here, then Sam Bakeman free got to walk free in one of them charges. See, that's a fact. The very next day, or was it the same day? Same day. Shout out to Chris for telling me that. Same day. Smoke and mirror strategy. <laughs> Talk about it. You think Bobby, a, a industry plant with that Drake interview, Sam Bankman Free, the biggest oh, she, plant of the last she, 30 years. She's dancing on him. She's dancing on him now. Bobby dancing. She got the Yachty interview. Mm -hmm. But what do so, I know? Oh, shout out to Elliot Wilson. Shout out to yes. Elliot. Um, he's been can't take two years off. He's been very vocal on social media. Lately. I've seen that. <laughs> I'm at the boy. Shout out to Yes Jules too. You actually know her. We know her. That was I was so crazy. Like when Drake said that he's doing yes, he's doing yes Jules interview. That's Drake, funny. Drake crazy man. But um, <laughs> shout out to shout out to Yes Jules and shout out to um Elliot Wilson, a pioneer, in a the legend, game. a super a pioneer legend. in the game. He's been, he's been very vocal though. Yeah. I'm glad it got the yeah. fire. I, it was a surprise. when they said it. I wasn't sure. I'm like, he's talking a lot. He's talking real spicy these days. Shout out to him. Shout out to B Dot. B Dot don't talk. Too much. I, I, we saw him at the Nas joint. Yeah, he, yeah, don't, yeah. Shout oh, to B -Dot. he don't talk too much. Yeah. But Elliot, too. Elliot, yeah, that was surprising. Elliot, we love that. you. You're well respected. I think it's just another lesson in the media landscape to not take a year off. Yeah, I mean, there's not too many people in this space that I, you know, you could say like I've been reading his articles for 20 plus years. Like 25 plus years been reading Elliot Wilson um editorials. Um legend. Legend. Yeah, I like Elliot. But but so, sometimes we need a little push to get it, give us our competitive flair. Like when all those top investors lists come out and I'm not on the I feel away. But you know, invest us, we may change that arc red panda. Now you look. Like and I mean he 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 was when we talk about ad value, we were two seconds away from him being the person that introduced us to Sean Carter. <laughs> He was. He saw us and said, "Come over, guys." Yeah, he's a good, he's a good dude. Elliot, Elliot's a good dude, man. Solid dude. He's, uh, he's very, very solid. Well, I mean, if I can branch off of that, like, uh, going for all my entrepreneurs, like, how do you keep that drive every single day, despite being fathers, despite being tired, traveling? Because I was talking to Shot the Wayno. I was talking to him about this yesterday too, because he has a show that's coming out, and I was like, the only like, I was like, your voice is needed, but the vultures, like, Adam got that little push from leaning the plug and he's been going live more than ever i feel like sometimes some of our greats won't keep our foot on the gas long enough so can you, for those who may be new like how do you guys push through the storms trials tribulations even when you don't feel like doing it i mean i think baby um brian williams he has a dope quote he's like you know every day the motivation is 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 the money is the motivation is to take care of your family to take care of your community to have a better a better life than than what you had growing up, to you know um, put yourself in a position of being comfortable, and um, to live the life that you that you want to live for yourself, as opposed to living a life that's dictated for you by somebody else. So stay focused on that, and then you you avoid a lot of the other stuff. So you know mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah, I will give you a simple answer, Ian. Um, I wake up every morning knowing that it's bigger than me. Mm. Is is much bigger than me. I feel like 
you know, people will, will say like you, you're doing God's work and it feels that way. Yeah. Um, so we wake up with, I wake up with that intent knowing that it's bigger. Than, even if I don't feel like it, like I know that there's a community of people, a <clears> of <throat> people that are relying on this information. Um, and so I would be doing a disservice to myself, my community, my family. Yeah. Um, and even under the eyes of what I've been called to do if I wasn't doing it. Um, so it's bigger than me. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of that almost maybe once a week when it's like, yo, do we got to, I really want to take this call? Yeah, we got to take it because yeah. we never know what it could lead to. And it, if it was, you know, what comes from that call. So it's always bigger than us, man. The mission is always bigger. And also gratitude. Like one of the things that I tell myself when I'm tired, I'll think back to when I was broke and I'll be like, I begged for this opportunity. Mm -hmm. I can't like not have gratitude and be like, cause it's almost a slap in the face to God to like, have some that's why like i take the presentation so serious um this year at invest fest maybe like the first one i maybe like go out the night before but just depends maybe <laughs> right e even for that like working on the presentation now um because even like being on the stage people hit me it's been like 10 people hit me like yo can you get me on stage and i'm like bro i do a show <laughs> every week to get considered to be on stage <laughs> are you crazy like i can't just walk you you haven't been on market mondays you ain't came to a show what are you crazy like, you give me i haven't been in my place in mexico since february you don't think i want to go there hey you got to stay and get the job done but i think in those moments when we get tired everyone please write this down please have gratitude for the blessings god has given you because even when I, I talked to joe after he called me about the little salacious stuff <laughs> i was like you know how do you keep going and he was like i'm lucky to be able to do this like Joe struggled throughout his career, had attacks from everybody at every label, went at Jay-Z and they're cool. And I'm like, gratitude. But mm -hmm. what a blessing it is. And and I tell people all the time, even with trading and investing, it's not just the time that I spent in the market is that I don't miss any days. Like there's a, a few people that can trade better than me week over week. When we go quarter over quarter, it's different because I'm following the same routine. And if I can give you guys advice tonight, it's like, please master your discipline and be in regiment and not missing any days or any weeks. Yeah. Yo, and that, that's that's a, a, a great point, man, because it when you when people say that to you, like even when we hear it and you tell us, it's like, imagine that three years ago to the date, like there wasn't a stage for people to ask to be on. Three At years all. later, yeah. now it's the stage that people want to be on. And I saw somebody say, look, you guys got so many people this year. Who you're going to have for next year? And shout out to my man, Edwin. And Edwin's in the comments. Yeah, my guy. Yeah, he, he was like, look, man, the point of this is that we're getting all this information so that we become the people that are on the stage. Yes. Right? Like, the people for next year will be the people who are working hard, doing a discipline, studying their craft, busting their tail, and adding value to their community. So they will be the people on stage. Yeah. It won't be who's the next people. It'll be I'm the next person because I've added so much value mm -hmm. and it's evident that I can add more and give more to the people. And when I saw him put that in the comments, I'm like, he Fire. gets it, man. Shout out and, to Edwin for that. He's man. one of the ones that's doing the work and has done the and, work. And he's definitely doing it. And he gets it. And he gets it. Shout out to Edwin, man. All right. Let's go to the next topic. Exxon Mobil. Um, yeah. Profits took a slide last quarter. Is it now time to invest in Exxon? Um, I think it's a little bit too soon. And even though their profits slid last quarter i mean they've had a monster tear in 2022 they really just hit the resistance that there was there before so around that 104 area to like 100 is usually where we see resistance um ideally i would like to get it maybe around 78 bucks or 60 bucks if it goes there now is a little bit too high they hit the all-time high and slid down mm -hmm. but for the year that they had last year no, I mean, it, it's like if Luca scores 29 th this year instead of 35 last year, is Luca falling off? No, we're not going to ESP and everything. Like Exxon Mobil has still done great, um, but I wouldn't invest. Now, if you are currently in the stock, I will continue to hold it. I would dollar cost average. Definitely got if it got to like 81 bucks, I will look to buy more there. Um, but more than anything, the most important thing is to try and get to a thousand shares in the company that you believe in. And then from there, get to 10,000. But Exxon has done incredibly well. Um, one of their best years was last year. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they've been on a great run. And if we go back even since 2004, 
They've only had one, two, three, four, five bad years, and that's as recent from 18 through. They're doing pretty damn good. So if you've been holding long term, um, you should be killing in this company right now. All right, I'm asking now from a short term, well, not short term, from a thousand share perspective, we're holding on to the company, we're, we're, we're adding to um, our portfolio. Does it make sense now or does it make sense now to trade, right? So investing and trading two different things, right? I'm mm -hmm. going to give you a couple of factors. Uh, U.S. oil production is on track to set new records in 2023 and 2024, mm -hmm. which is favorable. Interest rates are higher, which is favorable. Yep. Uh, and OPEC said they're going to cut back on production, right? So those, all those factors seem as if it would be favorable if I'm looking to invest into the, the stock on a trade position. What are your thoughts? Um, from a trading perspective, if I can get it like at 94, 25, or even 89, 46, I will swing trade it to the upside from, from that price for sure. Um, I will look to swing back to the upside. And also to any good company over a long period of time is going to go up major like any asset, like all asset classes are created to go up in value. Very few assets are created to say, hey, we're going to IPO this thing at $1 and we hope in the year goes down to zero. The only category that typically does that is like the SPAT arena. Um, Exxon Mobil definitely should be fine. Those are the levels I would look to get in. I would probably load the boat if it ever got to like 71, 69 and I would ride it back up to 104 and, and exit around there. But other than that, like uh, from a trading perspective, I, you still have to wait for like a great price even if people don't agree with my prices i understand but you have to wait for a level where the stock or future or forex pair has dropped in enough value where there's upside to it i think the stock has gotten too high to buy now but at those levels i definitely do like it and those factors definitely do help as well good to know my dear friend yeah good all right um let's talk about atlanta a place that we know very well well also well. Um, <laughs> Shout out to the city of Atlanta. When you yeah. put up this stat, I was befuddled. Like I literally put damn in the comments. So, <laughs> like, That's all you can say. I'm like, I, what else can you say at this rate? So like, so there's much. nothing else to say. They were they were expecting your usual a. Since the start, <laughs> since the start of since the start of 2023, the city of Atlanta has reported 72,600 evictions in seven months. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is already 10,000 evictions more than 2022. Mm -hmm. According to the data tracked and published by the Atlanta Federal Reserve Bank, there were 11,159 new evictions reported in June. From January to June, only about 15.5% of the evictions have proceeded. Um, so, okay. So a lot of people are getting evicted in Atlanta, mm -hmm. which I would assume is an indication for the broader country worldwide, mm -hmm. um, nationwide. So what is your thoughts about this disturbing trend? Um, the first thing I want to point out, some of these are rolling over from um the the period where people didn't have to pay but if i'm going to go into my conspiracy bag if inflation is getting higher the job market is not coming back i truly believe that these evictions are happening because they want their city back and by they we know who they is i'm gonna act like i'm Khaled. but i think maybe atlanta for too long has been too black and Atlanta and Georgia is normally a very friendly city when it comes to these evictions. But some of, going back to the pricing, some of the, the pricing in Midtown and in Buckhead is unaffordable for most people. I'm not counting the people that are ballers and have a bunch of money flowing in. Cool. But for the average person, if they want a three bedroom, four bedroom, the prices over the last year have increased dramatically. And if you want to change the demographics of a city, one of the fastest ways you can change them is by changing the price of the rental market. I think it's a mistake because if wages and income is not increasing as in fa as fast as the rental market pricing, 
These are the kind of things that will lead to a crash or collapse. We're seeing it with Airbnb. Airbnb at one point was looked at as an affordable option to hotels, and then mm -hmm. they got super sexy, and they tried to make every Airbnb a Rolls Royce, and the prices were too damn high. And guess what? Most Airbnb properties are not being rented out like how they were two years prior or three years prior. So if this continues for a long period of time, it can spell a lot of trouble. But the first thing I thought when, when I saw this, these amount, amount of evictions, um, they want to quietly find a way to displace some people out of the city of Atlanta and move them out to the suburbs. That was, that was great minds think alike because the first thing I thought was, especially being here in New York, the amount of time it takes to evict somebody versus the time it takes to evict somebody in Atlanta mm -hmm. or in, in well, Atlanta specifically. Right. So that was the first thing I thought. But the second thing is kind of like what you alluded to. Right. Like the kind of like when we first were learning about Airbnbs and how it could be super profitable to come in a couple of the cities we were thinking about with Miami and Atlanta. Yes. There was kind of a, a crackdown on that. And so, like, if you're not getting that money from Airbnb, now the person who actually has the lease has to now pay that, which could be, you know, something that they can't afford anymore. Right. The other part of it was the unemployment rate. Now, when we talk about unemployment, it, this kind of leads into like what you were saying. It was like, what type of jobs are being offered? Absolutely. What type of jobs do are we being offered? What type of jobs do we have? Who's being laid off and where are those layoffs happening? And so if you look at the demographics of Atlanta, right, we know specific counties that are predominantly look like us and people from our community. And so, yes, hospitalities lost jobs and construction is, are we getting these jobs? And so that talks about the income that is coming in to the households of the families in Atlanta. So there's a couple factors there, but the, the, the number is extremely staggering knowing that we're only in July and we still got, you know, five months to go in this year. Where, where is this number headed? Yeah. I mean, I would say, um, I said it was, I said on Instagram, it's a few different things. One of the things I said was, uh, that Georgia was a landlord friendly state mm -hmm. and a variety of different people disagreed with me on that and said, I didn't know what I was talking about and different things in nature. And then, um, one gentleman in particular, his name is Saint underscore Jermaine. And he said, uh, he just be talking sometimes. <laughs> and, um, does that get under your skin? <laughs> I like, I like how you read it though. Like you read, I would imagine that's how you said it. No, you be chatting. Shotty be chatting. I don't take anything personal, um, especially for somebody that I don't know. And it, I, I don't think that it was, um, it wasn't nice. Did, did you take that. it personal when he said he made us? I did. I think that was AI. I think that was gotcha. AI. The app caused the enemy. Alan Iverson. Alan Iverson. But um, Saint, yeah, you know, Saint, I, I don't, I didn't think that that was too nice of, of a thing to say. It wasn't nice. Um, but you know, obviously, there's a long list of different things. But you know, just the quick overview of Atlanta is, um, you can be evicted for not paying rent or for failing to move out at an ex expiration or termination. Of a, of a lease. If the landlord tries to evict you for not paying rent, you have seven days to pay <laughs> the rent owed or you can legally be evicted. Whereas whew, New York. New York's tough. A landlord must go to court, must win the case, then must pay a fee to have the law enforcement officer properly evict you. This is a whole process. You could literally stay in, in, in for two years before it's you actually on somebody's property in New York. Oh, no, for it's, sure. It's it's a whole thing. So when I'm saying that it's a landlord friendly state, is it the most landlord friendly state in America? I, I'm not sure. But when you're comparing it to states like New York, it's tremendously in favor of the landlord. Sometimes we have a we don't have a perception of things because we only look at it from our perspective. So it's like you might just live in Georgia, like oh, it's not a landlord friendly state. I've been trying to get this guy out for a month. Well, talk to the landlord in New York who really has no rights at all yeah. and has to deal with a squatter that's living there. And you got to go to court and you got to get law enforcement. And you literally, I think it's still with it last year. I think somebody's squatting here for six. Not only, not only are they squatting, they damaging the property. Now you got to have rehab come in 
after they leave, it's a whole process. It's extremely hard to kick somebody out. Yeah. So I say that to say it's all perspective. If you don't think it's a landlord friendly state, that's your that's your right. But compared to a lot of other states, like New York, no it's Jersey. a landlord, it's a it's yeah. a landlord friendly state. So I think that that's definitely um in favor of people getting evicted because you don't have to put up with it. They're not paying that you can just kick them out. I think it also has to do with um the haves and have nots because rent prices are going up and as rent goes up it, you know s- certain point in time you can't afford to pay your rent so there are people still getting money there are people that still stimulate in the economy but everybody is not at that same pace mm-hmm. and the rent prices are, are only like skyrocketing in these in these major cities i told yeah. you about that the guy that was paying $10,000 a month for one bedroom in New York. So we're going to start seeing, this is a broader conversation where there's, there's going to be a housing crisis. If, if this isn't under control because everybody wants to live in in cities or close to cities, nobody wants to live in in nowhere and, and Mm -hmm. in farm fields and different things of nature. So everybody, you have the vast majority of people trying to live in a couple different places. Right. You have like big areas where you have New York, you have L.A., you have Miami, you have Atlanta, you have like, you know, 10 different major. Yeah, cities. 10 came to Austin and everybody's trying to live in, in these 300 million people. Everybody's trying to live in these different areas. Um, so there's a demand because even if, if you can't afford to live here, then somebody else can. So it doesn't even affect the landlord. Because it's like, you know, for every five people that can't afford to live here, then there's 10 people that can't afford to live here. So I'm just going to keep right. I'm going to keep rising. Incomes have been pretty stable. Incomes aren't rising at the same pace of inflation. So that's that's a problem. And then you have people that's going to start losing their jobs, losing jobs to AI, losing jobs to just there's just going to be a new industries, losing jobs for a variety of different reasons. So. What you're creating is a, is a housing um, crisis, and this is a broader conversation. But this is an early stage of that. This is the yeah. early stage when you start to see this many evictions. This is a this is a, something that's alarming, um, and you start seeing people living in in rooms, renting rooms, and mm-hmm. living together in communal spaces. <clears throat> um, this is something that has to be addressed, and if it doesn't have a fix to it in the next ten to twenty years, you're going to see. It's, it's going to be bad. The homeless yeah. population now, if you look, if you go to cities like L.A., if you go to cities like San Francisco, the homeless population is out of control. That's going to spread. Terrible. You wouldn't even know that you was in America. And it's like, take a city like Miami. How much more can real estate go up in a short period of time before it just becomes completely unsustainable? Mm-hmm. Right? Everybody's not a billionaire. Everybody's not a millionaire. Some. Where is everybody going to live? You can only push people out to the outskirts for so far. For, at a certain point, there's no more outskirts. Middle America? Shout huh? out to the middle west. Don't y'all come there. Stop pushing them to the middle of America. I'm saying you just can't. Like That's like relocation. I'm yeah. talking about you pushing people yeah. to the outskirts. It's like oh, yeah. uh, you, you, you move from New York to Jersey. This is like, but it just keeps getting wider and wider and wider. Yeah. With they, they don't have anywhere to live eventually. Yeah, I mean, we've seen that, right? Like We've seen people go from New York City then they end up in Northern Westchester, then they end up in Poughkeepsie, then they end up in mm-hmm. Albany, then they end up in Rock. And so they are pushing them. Well, what happens is that you... you but there's a certain point that you can't... You can't push, push them so to you, Canada. You start you start in Manhattan. Right. You start in Lower Manhattan. Then you work your way up. Mm-hmm. Then you're in... Which used to be Hell's Kitchen on the Upper West Side. Now that's... I don't even call it Hell's Kitchen anymore. It's a whole different neighborhood. It's completely gentrified. Then... You start moving to Harlem, mm-hmm. then you start calling it Northern Manhattan, mm-hmm. which is insane. No ho. <laughs> <laughs> then, 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 you, then you start moving up to Washington Heights. They got a name for that now. They trying to gentrify that. Where really? Is, yeah, I forgot what they trying to call it. Trying to gentrify that. Mm-hmm. Then, Not at all. Then, then you go to the Bronx, Sobro. That's what they call in the South Bronx. I still now. haven't heard anybody say that's that. crazy. That's bro. Ma- they have a name for it. Yeah, you got to have a name for it before you fully implement the plan. Got to rebrand it. Rebrand like it. Elon did with Twitter, change the X. You got to rebrand. You got to change the name. You, so now you go. Now you got the Bronx. Now you try. So it's like it happens, and it just do 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 do. Before you know it, 
it's, it's a whole different city. Yeah. Dangerous. Very, very dangerous. They want their cities back. And meanwhile, they're trying to convince us that everything is fine in the economy and the stock market is okay. And there's only like 11 stocks internationally that are doing well. Like if, if we have to put our lives on it outside of the ones we've called, are there any, Troy, you sent a great one, right? But are there like 15 stocks that we would just bet our lives on, like our life savings on? That's, no, that's, there's weakness in the economy overall. And if there is not affordable housing solutions, at some point the people are going to revolt. Yeah. They are going to revolt. Yeah. And they're going to be at your door. Be careful of that. Yep. And, and the crazy part, it's only going to take maybe two months. Like the same thing with, with the music strike and, if people quit paying rent in one part of New York for three months, oh, baby, some changes will happen immediately. It doesn't take yeah. that much. Yeah, rent strike. They tried that before, rent strike. Yeah, it needs to happen because it's feeling like 07 all over again. So you're for, you're, you're pro rent strike? Well, I, I I currently don't have any tenants, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to say the landlord's about to be at your neck. <laughs> I'm not pro rent strike because I feel like landlords that you you you, sh you shouldn't you don't deserve for somebody to just commit to paying you something and then not paying you. Not pay it, yeah. That that's something that I don't agree with. Yeah. Um, I also think it should be affordable though. But it's all this is also important, right? It's in, from the other aspect of it. And shout out to uh, Brandon Rule. Uh, alumni uh, of EYL having developments that are built specifically to have affordable housing, right? So I know he just got a, a grant for fifty million. Do you see that? He got a fifty million dollar oh, grant. To, he will be at Investfest. He will be there to to build. Um, I believe it's in Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama. He's building one hundred and twenty two units. But those type of very intentional and strategic uh, developments help combat that. So it's like, all right. Well, this is what it's going to be based on the economy that we're building in, mm -hmm. right? But so when we have developers that look like us, and that's why he's a gem. And I mean, because the way he's able to break things down and explain it to our community, it's incredible. But we need more branding rules. That's why it's important to be in the rooms because I'm sure there's somebody who never knew that they can actually obtain that type of professionalism and career. It's important to have him because you can make these systemic changes, right? When we're looking for affordable housing and having our our people's uh and intentions at the front of, of the discussion, we can be in the room and, and, and making sure that the development happens in a way that benefits everybody. So it's important to have that. So shout out to him. I just wanted to mention that. And affordable housing is important, but that's kind of like a Band-Aid because it's like, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not a solution. It's not a, it's not a long-term solution. What's Where? A, what, what's a long-term solution is getting people to make more money. Absolutely. Like, that's true too. It. So it's like just that's giving people affordable housing and putting them in situations where they can live is beneficial because people do need somewhere to live. Yeah. But they're still ultimately then they're not still not making enough to even live there. So you're just you're still struggling. You might have a nice apartment, but mm -hmm. that doesn't solve your problem. But what happens in the time that you're there? Right. So that could be the thing, right? Like if I don't have to worry about what the roof over my head, right? Now I have a mindset where I have a freedom to actually think. I have freedom to now create I have a, almost a sense of peace of mind knowing that I can at least afford to live. That basic need is taken care of. Can I be innovative inside that time while I'm here? Yeah, it doesn't happen. It, yeah, it, 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 it doesn't happen. It's it hard doesn't ha can it happen? happen? Can it any, happen? Any, anything can happen, but I'm just I'm just speaking from this is just experience. Saying I've, I've, I've seen. <laughs> it's an experience. No, it's just a, it's just a fact. People become comfortable. So you you have somewhere to live. That's beneficial and that's needed. And you usually it's just, OK, I'm now I have this taken care of and I'm going to work enough and it's going to be enough to pay these bills. And it's a it's a recipe to just stay as a renter for your whole life. Let me just finish. Mm -hmm. it, you stay as a renter your whole life. You'll never own anything um, and you'll never move up the economic scale. This isn't just my own personal biased opinion. This is with things that I've seen. I've, I've witnessed this firsthand. Very rarely does people, do they move up the economic scale? They don't mm -hmm. move up the economic scale. They just stay there. And who is that ultimately benefiting? Business, 
because they're getting government subsidies. It's not like they're doing this out of their, their own good of their heart. They're yep. getting government subsidies mm -hmm. to have 10% of these luxury apartment buildings to have affordable units and to, and to build these and different things of that nature. So there is a win for them. And the government is just printing money. They don't care. Um, so the only people that's, that they think that they're benefiting is the people that are in this. But it's really a, it's really a, a trap to keep people on this same type of government assistance treadmill yeah. that it never helps. Well, never, it doesn't when, help anybody. When you say you, you've seen it firsthand, you're speaking of a specific time period. I'm speaking of this actual time period where people have access to more resources, access to more information, and are actually educating themselves. That we are actually seeing firsthand, right? Like we are seeing that. It's the reason why we do this every Monday. It's the reason why we put out content every day. So people are more aware and have more information than they've ever had. That might be true for a time period, but there has to be optimism and saying like, yo, the work that we're actually doing. And that's why I said like a guy like Brandon is so important to see it happening. I believe it, it can change that. No, I'm all for affordable. First, there was always information. There's different stages of information. At this, this level? This, let me finish. <laughs> it's all relative, right? So there was like before there was no such thing as a library. Then there was a library. Then there was no such thing as a computer. Then you had access to the internet. Then there was no such thing. So th there's always been access to information. There's never been as much information that's, that's readily available to you. But you could always change your life based off of information at any point in time. So why hasn't it happened previously? Well, that's what I just said. So I don't. I'm not optimistic. That it's going to change now. First, second, I think that people that listen to us definitely want to improve their situation for sure. Mm. But ultimately, I'm not just talking about the hundred thousand people that watch Market Mondays every single week. I'm talking about fifty million people, a hundred million people that are impacted that never even heard of Earn Your Leisure before. So this is something that's way bigger than than even the people that we're reaching. Right? This is a systematic problem that has to be figured out for the greater good of America, but America. also the whole entire world, because it's, it's a global issue as well. So yes, we're going to reach a lot of people, but it's still a drop in the bucket. In comparison. If, if we change a million people's lives, that's still a drop in the bucket compared to 50, 70, 90 million people that can't afford to live somewhere. So while how, Apple and Walmart is taking their business and going to India. And while Elon Musk is about to become a trillionaire, so it's like we've this is the great disparity in wealth that's happening. Mm -hmm. This this is my point. It's a it's a disparity in wealth that's unlike anything that we've ever seen in human history, yep. where the the rich are getting extremely wealthy at levels that people couldn't even imagine, and the people at the bottom are staying at the bottom. So some affordable housing, yes, that's good, but we have to figure out a way to get the people at the bottom to catch up, whether that's through different skill set whether that's through a variety of different things, but just providing things for them, although it's beneficial and it's needed, is not the they ultimate solution no. to get them in an upward mobility trajectory. It, it, it's not the end all be all, but it does, it does put off the, you know what, the basic need, right? Shelter. And that's what I'm saying. Like if we have, have that, and of course there's plenty of issues and yes, this is not the end all be all and it's not the only solution or even a part of a solution to, you know, uh, bring in that wealth gap. But it does meet the first basic need, shelter, food, shelter. Right. After we have those basic needs, Mount, what can we do? If I got two questions for you. So what, what number should everyone be striving to be at on an annual or decade basis? As far as if, if Jalen Brown got 340. 304. 304. What would Jason yeah. Tatum get next year when he renegotiates then? 350? Three, yeah, well, that's there. what I'm saying. This is this is this is a it's a it's a unique yeah. moment. And we'll talk about Mbappe, who got turned down 776 million. But I personally feel like it depends on where <laughs> <laughs> it depends on where you live. <laughs> but um if you if you live in a city, I don't know. I just feel like if you make anything, if you live in a, a city like New York or, or surrounding areas. I don't. I, I just feel like it's extremely difficult to live if you're making anything over less than a hundred thousand dollars. Just to live, mm -hmm. you, you, it's just to live. Yeah, it's going to be extremely difficult. 
Yeah, so I broke. Live. That's great. I broke that number down with my son the other day, um, just because I wanted to give him context of like what a hundred thousand dollars is after taxes, especially in New York, um, after rent, right? And we just based it off of paying thirty percent, right? Most people say like you want to pay around thirty percent of your monthly income should go to your your living, which would bring it down to three thousand dollars. After we did all that, his car, his groceries, his phone bill, he realized he had uh, five hundred dollars. So spend for the month. And that was just him as a single person. Like, that's not him with. I was like, well, you're going to have a wife or a girlfriend? He was like, we're going to have to, we're going to have to figure that out. We're going to have to eat cheese sandwiches. I'm like, well, all right, let's see how long that, that, that stays around. But like, <laughs> how that he, stays around? Not long. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Like, a hundred thousand. I'm, I'm, I think it has to be more. I think that's like the bare minimum, especially in a state like New York. Uh, what, what number gives you comfort or freedom? Because that twenty eight million number that I said to be rich, it does not sound so crazy now. No, well, I think that I, I think ten million dollars. That's been my number as yeah. far as to have and to to live comfortably on like an annual basis. Basis, yeah. I think that you got to be pulling in a half a million minimum, right? Yeah. If my we financial... have honest talk and just talk like it's just us. Yeah, no. Now my, my financial advisor told me this at at when I was twenty six years old. You might know him. He's sitting next to me. He's like, look, the number. <laughs> 10 million. I was like, what you mean it's 10 million? He's like, it's 10 million. If you have $10 million, if you invest that in a, a fund and get 3% annually, that's 300000 a year. Can you live off the interest of that? And I looked at myself, I was like, yeah. And so in my mind, I was like, 10 million. It's crazy that you just said that. We ain't, yeah. we ain't prompt that. But that's, he told me that 20 years ago. 10 million has always been my number. 10, <laughs> 10 million has always been my number. And, but I also, I don't want to discourage people because I don't want to yeah. seem like, you know, I know obviously the, the most people don't have ten million dollars. Most people aren't making five hundred thousand dollars a year. So I'm not. I'm not trying to um, discourage you by saying these numbers. But I mean, you asked me a question, so I just. We I just have gotta, to give the honest answer. I just got to answer it, and this is why marriage is important, right? Because it's like, okay, you mm -hmm. might you might make two hundred. Your spouse might make three. Now that's five hundred, right? Where it's easier for two people to make five hundred thousand than it is for one person to make five hundred thousand. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just I just got to be be honest with you. Because I just don't see now. Obviously, if you're living in Wyoming or different things of that nature, then you know it's it's a lot different. But I just I just don't see it happening. And I see I know people that make two fifty that you know are living paycheck to paycheck, and you know mm -hmm. it's like you know it's different living D Washington D.C. and you know something like that where it's extremely um, high cost of living. San Francisco, same thing. Oh, yeah, LA, 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 LA. Like, LA you Alabama. know it's yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. Arizona. Yeah. It's tough, it's, and it's and it's and the, the sad thing about it is it's only getting worse. Mm -hmm. We see inflation is going up, like it's only getting worse. So this is why when you watch Market Mondays, inflation going down, interest rates going up over the course of time. Inflation yeah. is always going to go up. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. It's always going to go up. Yeah, yeah. So it might go down short term, but over the course of time, ten years from now, inflation is yeah. a dollar today is not going to be worth a dollar ten years from yeah, now. You're right, you're right. So sure. it's like you know when you watch Market Mondays, part of this is. You have to figure out how to earn money, business, and all of that. This is what we provide during Earn Your Leisure time. But Market Monday is another part of it. Is this is why it's important to invest money? You have to because you have to have your money working for you and your money. And that's another stream, really, of revenue that is growing through income that can be provided through investments, stock market, real estate, crypto, different things of that nature. So. It's important to learn these things because if, if you're not educated properly and you don't know how to invest and you don't have a business, um, I don't I don't know how you ever reach any level of financial freedom. Um, and that's not that's not a good place. That's not a good place to be in. I mean, while I'm tearing through the pages, hold on, cover this up real quick for those who need a recommendation. Barron's. Is a good resource, Wall Street Journal, Money Master the Game, I've talked about before. Um, go through this information every day as you're seeing it. Like, and this is what I was saying last week about Disney. If one of the greatest media companies in the history of America is having some trouble, you don't think the individuals are having trouble? Like, that's what I'm posing to the audience. Like, I know the, the perception on Instagram is everybody's balling, everybody's okay, no one has any financial concerns. Trust me. If Bob Iger publicly is going on TV and saying, hey, may have to sell off ESPN, they're not doing so because they haven't looked at every resource possible and how to get ESPN to be profitable. So if they're having trouble, the average person is having troubles in 
their home. Even like when I had a conversation with my mom and dad too, like they were having a conversation with me about the Kathy thing too. And I was like, yo, you got to make the pivot to be prominent in a hedge fund space because who knows when that door is going to close. I can't take for granted that that opportunity will be there or any other opportunity is going to be there. Like the time is now. So like even when we do these shows and there's a certain level of like determination that you see, it does. I don't take any of this for granted. The show, the loyalty for Red Panda. Um, I always say it. If Cardi and Jason Momoa get together, I don't know what I'm going to do. That's my doomsday scenario. Like Cardi figures out how to trade futures. It's over with. She does a show. What I'm gonna, You have to prepare. What I'm trying to stress to everyone tonight is like prices of everything is going to go up. And even if you own a house, yes, you may get a great interest rate, but you still got to pay property taxes. And those can go up mm -hmm. depending on where you live. And the richer you get to, there's going to be more ways for people to find a way to get money out of your pocket. And then on the other side, the people that you take care of may not be loyal to you after you take care of them. Look what Diddy did for Ciroc. I'm going to be real. I ain't know nothing about Diageo before Diddy got there. And they screwed him out of a deal. We will talk about that in investments. <laughs> for like, sure. What? He Man. probably, what, 100x their business? Conversation worth having. Right. All right. The warning. This episode will be labeled warning. I love it. This is a warning. Um, let's talk about the stock market again, if we can. Um, so with overall market steadily increasing, what would be a sign for a reversal? Um, if we have honesty from the hedge funds or the government that the economy isn't as doing as well as we think, or like uh, from the top of the ES or the top of the Dow, because I know the Dow had like the 13 day win streak. Um, if we drop 10%, that would be the only thing that would call. And these levels, you have to map out while the market is at a high. So I'm not really worried about a reversal so much. But for me personally, I'm looking to see if we pull back 10% from that all time high. Um, and my primary indicators too are like if Apple and Microsoft start to have trouble. Because if Apple and Microsoft draw down four or five percent, a Russell 2000 company probably would drop 20, 25 percent as a result. So with them being the top two, I'm always keeping my eye to see what they're doing. Because if you look at the, the ES or the Dow, what Apple and Microsoft have done year over year is generally what the Dow is going to do or the ES is going to do. So until they until they pull down five percent, I'm not really worried. But have your uh, level set for the ES to drop 10 percent as a way to know if we should start to panic or not. Something interesting happened great over, the, over the weekend, Ian. I wonder from a geopolitical standpoint, we just saw that the U.S. announced $345 million in military aid to Taiwan. I saw that on the news, and sure. that that troubles me. Tell it me why it, it troubles you. Well, we, we spoke about from a geopolitical standpoint of the importance of Taiwan. We talked about it from a semi-space. We, we talked about it when Warren Buffett um, was speaking about the importance of TSM. Uh, the fact that they're selling military aid, to, there's a reason why. Mm -hmm. um, and that would perhaps be that they're preparing perhaps from for a conflict. Mm -hmm. At the top of mind, I would think that China would be the conflict that is on the horizon. Yep. Uh, and we talked about the importance of what Taiwan means to our economy. When it comes to not only the semis but the companies that rely on them, specifically Apple. Um, what are your thoughts on that, man? When you, you talked about some of the factors with, with the market, we saw what happened when in 2021 when the Ukraine uh, Russia conflict started. Yep. This one has a little bit different feel, uh, but the severity could be far greater. You got to protect the your prize asset. Um, the other thing that is interesting china because they haven't been engaged in that many wars they're using a lot of our playbook against us now so i think it's smart to send aid but is it a warning signal that china could be on attack yes we have navy ships close to them and also we meddle in that taiwan issue with these feel like it's theirs mm -hmm. so we have to be defensive like and i've said it before like if they didn't have the geopolitical issue if you think NVIDIA ran, TSM would have been probably a 40% higher than NVIDIA is right now if that risk was not there. 
Um, but that's something you definitely have to look out for because if they get Taiwan and invade and take that over, it is going to be catastrophic for us. Like we are in a chips and AI race. Mm -hmm. And a few people have said it, but the war that is being fought now is not going to be boots on the ground and solely missiles. This is more of a financial, technological asset kind of war to try and topple an empire. Um, so, we, and we need a leader that is going to either have to find a way for us to have a more diplomatic relationship with China, or ultimately we're going to end up losing. This isn't the 1980s where we can just go in and bully everyone and be like, hey, you're going to get down and lay down. They're not playing that. Meanwhile, uh, Russia has eliminated some of the debt of some African countries while having partnership with China. Like this is a di like this is a movie. Where is Kiefer Sutherland when you need him or Mark Wahlberg or somebody to come in and save the day? Like we have to protect Taiwan at all costs because if we if we lose that, that's a chess piece on the board that we cannot afford to go down. It's interesting. Indeed. Indeed. So all right. Let's talk about well, should people buy Apple or Disney? Should Apple buy Disney? Should Apple buy Disney? Oh, okay. Um, there's been a lot of conversations about this. Um, and I said a few months ago that Disney would come down to around 80 bucks. It's not there yet. It's getting close. There is synergy there, but I don't know what at what price would be fair to current shareholders to buy it. I know there's a lot to... Now, if they have plans to do stuff with the Vision Pro, which if they don't get that price and model together, that won't be a hit. But could they use the catalog? Yes. I think they really need to spend a lot more time on hiring people that can make that Marvel franchise work because I think they've ran it into the ground. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I like Doctor Strange, but I don't want to see four more Doctor Strange films, Like just to be honest. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think they need to figure out what to do and this goes back to the same conversation that's on your shirt, assets over liabilities. Like what properties, like Disney's in an interesting space where they, they either have to go all digital and focus on content or focus on the parks. It's really hard to do both because you can only put so much capital into so many things. And this goes back to laser focus. Like a lot of times when people want you to do more, you end up diluting your drop power, drop powder and your mental capacity to do both things well. It's really hard to do media and invest. Now imagine if on top of that, I wanted to be um, a clown and a hater on top of that, as some have been <laughs> towards us, right? You can only put your efforts and energies towards a few things and be great at them. And I think Disney is at an interesting fork in the road, whether they have to decide if they are going to be a commercial real estate company while costs are going up and inflation costs are eating them alive or to be a... Um, or to be a content provider. And I think one thing that Apple has done incredibly well is not bit off more than they can chew, no pun intended. Mm -hmm. And if they did buy it, I think it would be around like the $40 or $37 level if it ever got the low. I don't think that it will, but that would be the price if I was like sitting on Apple's board that I would suggest to possibly acquire Disney. Yeah. I mean, the, the relationship is positive when, when they made the announcement about the Vision Pro. The first streaming service that they said would be featured on it is mm -hmm. Disney Plus, and obviously Bob Iger and Tim Cook have had a good relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so it's there, and even when he was giving the press conference about all some of the troubles that the the company is having, we talked about we're talking to partners now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would assume if they've had their relationship already with the Vision Pro and having that the, as a premier service. Yeah. on that device that they've had other conversations and uh we spoke last week about a company that potentially could also be in conversations yeah and lo and behold they put out an announcement for exactly what we talked about so um i i, I like the fit um you know it's it's better to to have people who are interested in, in something a service you provide or a business that you have than not have any suitors um so yeah. it'll be it'll be something to watch Sha, what do you think? You've uh, put together a couple hit shows. If you were Apple, would you acquire Disney or would you leave it alone? Or is there better content play out there for them to acquire? No, I think it's an extremely capital intensive business from the amusement parks to the content creation to the networks. So I don't know if it makes sense to acquire something like Disney. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's going to take a lot of money to try to 
rebranded or however they want to curate a new version of Disney. Yeah. You know, Disney is something that is a huge, huge company with yeah. tons of employees and tons. Yeah, let me look up how many they have. Uh, yeah, it's something that you know. I think um, not easy. Two hundred twenty thousand employees. Woo! Yeah, it's not an easy. What is that payroll like? <laughs> not an easy. Um, you know, acquisition. It's not like you're just acquiring a startup company or acquiring a social media company. So yeah, I think that 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 probably won't won't happen. I, I I would say that that probably won't happen. That's a lot. Yeah, partnerships, partnerships. I think strategic partnerships. With some divisions, ES, ESPN being a division, um, I think that 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 might be a better route. Yeah, they laid off seven thousand people, which is only three point two percent of their total headcount of two twenty. They are currently trying to save five point five billion in costs. That's a lot of damn jobs for it not to have seven thousand jobs is three percent of your workforce. Whew. Five billion. That's 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 a number. That's a tough number to get to. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Yeah. It, it, it's possible though. I mean, you figure with with the with the strike that's happening right now. That's I true. Mean, I mean, the, the thing that I posted stock club to this past weekend. Uh, I mean, this past week. Um, damn, I forgot. I'll send y'all the link after this. But like, with everybody being on Instagram and TikTok, culturally, we're in a very interesting place where like most of the people who consume media want to be stars. How many people does Instagram have on? Their platform, two billion, three billion. Half of those people actually want to be. They don't want to sit through, eat, pray, love part two or whatever the hell movies that like. <laughs> we're at an interesting place in time where like the marketplace for content is shrinking because we have so many people who are trying to make content themselves. I think it's just there the interest, especially on like their hundred hundredth anniversary. Disney's just in a tough place. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, Mickey Mouse, here we come. <laughs> we, will see, we will see what this will play out. But let's switch gears. Let's go to sports. And let's talk about – let's start with basketball. Um, and shout out to New York City. Speaking of basketball, yes. Dyke, we started off 1-0. and Yes. Congrats on that Thank you. We have a very big game on Wednesday at 8 o'clock. Um, so everybody come out. This is very important. Um, so Dykeman Park, eight o'clock on Wednesday. We will be there. Mm -hmm. For That's sure. Birdie, Birdie lives. Yeah, we look sure. we look good. We look good. Shout, shout out to Fred, shout out to me, shout out to Say Cool. Shout out. It was a lot of good energy. Yeah. That first game. It was good. You know, Dink. The, Dink was shout out to Dink. Uh shout out to Dre, shout out to Mill, the whole the whole coaching uh, Jared. Uh, Dave. It was a great team, you know what the, it was uh the expectation of how we would perform was heavy um so that the guys came out there and played well um and played real basketball like yeah. it was like a real basketball game that took place so so shout out to, to the guys for holding it down and making the brand stand strong that's mm -hmm. important yes. the brand got to be strong earn your we leisure. look good out there earn your leisure or earn your leisures as they call us up there yes <laughs> <laughs> earn your um, so Jalen Brown, NBA star, good dude. We met him. Um, he signed the largest contract in NBA history. Mm -hmm. And uh, during his press conference, he mentioned wanting to uh, build a black Wall Street of sorts in Boston, mm -hmm. which obviously he plays for the Boston Celtics. And it's interesting because Boston is one of these cities that has one of the worst wealth gap disparities in America, I forgot the exact number, but I, it was around at one point they were saying that, you know, the average white family's net worth was 110,000 for the average Bostonian and the average black family's net worth was $8. Mm -hmm. Jesus. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that was the Kipling report. So, yeah. So, Boston has had a long history of racism. It's interesting because it's in the north. So, you know, a lot of people, when you think of racism, you think of Southern states, KKK. But Boston has had a historic history of being extremely racist city and sporting events particular. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of athletes have had different instances where they've, you know, been called racial slurs and different things. I think Boston's always been like a real racist place. Uh, not everybody's racist, but no, that's, no. His, that's his history. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, is what it, it is what it is. So yeah, it's interesting, and of course, it, you know, it caught a lot of 
attention in the financial literacy community and business and investing and everything to that nature. So um, what's your thoughts on this? Um, I think it was an amazing statement. Um, twofold, like I wish, parts of me wish that he didn't say it, but only because I wonder, although the statement was amazing, it was beautiful, it was eloquent, I wonder if that puts a target on his back. That's always my first thought when we announce something in public. But I think it's amazing to see an athlete on the day that he signs an amazing contract, which he's worked his entire life for, turn his focus to the community and not make it about him. Like, mm -hmm. I think that's beautiful. And I wish we saw more of that. And hopefully this starts a wave in which every athlete who gets a big contract like that finds a way to invest back into the community. Because a lot of times people will hear these numbers and be like, well, how does it benefit me? For the first time in a long time, I've heard an athlete at least put together a desire to have a plan to want to give back and close the wealth gap that we've been talking about all night. So from that standpoint, I thought it was absolutely um, amazing. And it, the statement was eloquent, um, amazing. And I, and I feel like his heart is in the right place as well. So that, that definitely brought me joy. Yeah. First, congratulations to him uh, for signing that contract. I think it's important where he was doing it. And it, it alludes to what you were saying is about the community, right? He didn't do it at the, the Celtics headquarters. He didn't do it at the practice facility. He did it at his uh, Juice Foundation Bridge program um, yep. inside of the community of Boston. Like you said, he's signing the wealthiest contract in the history of the NBA. The first thing he talks about is the, the, the wealth gap. And this is not new. It didn't surprise me that it came from Jalen because he's been a person that's been vocal about many things um, that revolve around the injustice of our people, whether it be economic or whether it be social. Um, and he had a whole article inside the New York Times, uh, I believe right after the All-Star break, about being black in the city of Boston mm -hmm. and what that comes with and when you're not performing at a, a, at a level that they, you know, have expectations for. And he's very vocal about that. And, you know, a lot of people didn't like that. But if you look at the history, like Shadi said, and it's I think fantastic. Netflix has a great documentary on Bill Russell. If you watch the documentary on Bill Russell, it gives you a glimpse into, I mean, one of the greatest athletes in the history of the city, definitely in the history of the NBA, and the greatest champion that the NBA has seen, the things that he faced even at the level of winning inside of that city. Um, and so it, it makes me, and, and it makes me think back to his time when we talk about athletes who take on activism, all right? Because Jalen spoke up when, uh, you know, the George Floyd incident happened. He was very vocal during that. Um, and so this, is, this has been happening throughout his career. Yeah. Now, they, he got a lot of, negative feedback when he signed with, with Ye and obviously Ye, you know, went through his situation and he he left the label. And then when Kyrie was going through his situation, Jalen Brown was vocal about that. But at least he's speaking. Yeah. Right. Like at least he's saying what's on his mind. He's a very from what you know, everything we've seen and when we've encountered him, a very thoughtful young man. Um so I was proud. And I told you earlier the word that he used that really was like he gets it. It was like these numbers are very well known. And it's unsettling to me. So even yeah. in the height of the, you know, his prowess as a professional inside of uh, athletics, when he's signing this contract, he still knows that there's a part of me that that is unsettling, that piece of it. Yes, this is like a celebratory time for me, but what else can we do? Which I, I was very proud to see from him. Rashad, your thoughts? Um, no, I mean, I, I think, you know, the same thing. I think that it was definitely – encouraging for him to see but you know i think that there's a new wave of a lot of athletes that have that type of mentality from Kyrie Irving to himself to a bunch of other people um where you know community based yeah and uh i think the first step is to you know just have that mindset now of course it's, it's tremendously difficult to kind of implement some i don't know what his actual plan is it would be interesting to talk to him about it mm -hmm. i feel that you know physical black wall street might not be um something that is a top priority if I was doing that um, because I feel like, you know, brick and mortar, we're not in the same day and age that we were a hundred years ago. Yeah. But as far as the overall stimulating the economy, my, this is my thing. I feel that there's a few things that could be beneficial and not just from him, but from a variety of different people, but starting a private equity firm, to invest in black businesses yep. that can scale to the hundred million dollar billion dollar valuation level, starting venture capital firms that can do the same thing, um, starting political action parties 
to really have a political system in place to, you know, fund politicians that want to push agendas that we can benefit from as a community. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing that's, that's the, you know, 2023, 2020, 34, like this, this is what I think we should be at now. And yeah. I'm not, and I don't want to discount what he's saying as far as black wall street, it's, it's important and it's significant in our history. But I just feel like now, you know, the brick and mortar businesses and the small businesses, like we have to start thinking about how do we take our businesses public and how do we get, you know, to the, to that highest level possible. Yeah. And I think that that is something that, you know, not having access to capital is something that stops a lot of businesses from succeeding. So having, you know, an incubator system and put in place to actually help businesses on a mentorship program grow mm -hmm is beneficial but then also having like i said those private equity or those venture capital firms and black banks to provide lending funding investment mm -hmm. into startup companies to help them grow is probably i think the most beneficial thing that can be done right now i agree like i was thinking about this yesterday great like troy said great minds think alike because xander's asking me about aau basketball now and i'm like okay that's great he's eight but we have no AAU farm system for black businesses in this country. Like we'll put our kids in a camp at five, six, seven, eight, nine. But we like the average entrepreneur that starts a business at 29 has no clear pipeline of who to go to to get funding, even if the idea is a hit. Like that's sad. So I definitely agree. Like that's one of the biggest solutions that we need to fix over these next few years. And hopefully uh, after we curate these great synergies and frequencies that invest us, hopefully Robert and a few others that have some solutions on how we can do that and put that together. But it's definitely important. It's definitely important. So staying on the, the sports conversation, Jalen, $304 million for how many years? Five. Five, five years. So he's getting so six, 60 million a year. Five years, $304 million. Mm -hmm. uh, Mbappe. Kelly in. Mbappe. French of, I think he's, his family's originally from Congo. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Uh, Let me, I'll double check. I'm pretty sure. Okay. One of the greatest soccer players currently playing mm -hmm. had a hell of a performance in the World Cup. They lost, but he had like five goals that game. It was crazy. Damn. Um. That, so, Saudi Arabia. They're gonna kill you. Not that game. Right. One during the, the series, he had three. Did he have three? He had. I think he went for a hat trick in the, the final. No, he had like four goals in the final. I it watched it. Yeah, he, had he had three. I think he had more because then then it was a penalty kick. So those don't count. They don't count those. They're, they're goals. They don't count. How many goals did he have? I think he had three. All right. But they don't count the up now. He had three goals. Yeah, and, penalty and, kicks don't and, count. And, and two penalty kicks. But One um, penalty kick, bro. Stop. Paris. <laughs> so he, he's, he's in PSG right now. Yes. And um, so this is interesting. So um, this is what they offered him. Saudi Arabian team Al Halil. Uh at a proposed fee of three hundred and thirty-two million to his team, they had to pay the team three hundred and thirty-two million to try okay. to negotiate to, mm -hmm. to, to get him off. That was like the Mile fee, transfer buy. transfer fee. Yeah, um, and then they offered him seven hundred and seventy-six million, and it sent shockwaves well, for for one year. For one year, okay, yes, and um, it sent shockwaves through the whole entire you know sports industry. So Saudi Arabia's Public investment fund, fund, yep, backed by Al Halil, was previously linked to Argentinian legend Leo Messi, Leonardo Messi, when they tried to get him, but then he went to Miami mm -hmm. um, before making his move to enter Miami. Mm -hmm. So the latest, you know, offering just shows how much Saudi Arabia is willing to spend for athletes. They offered Tiger Woods a billion dollars. To play golf, he didn't. He turned that down. They Stupid. offered Messi six hundred million, something like that. Something crazy, like six hundred. Yeah, like yeah. He he turned it down. Now they offered Mbappe. Well, somebody did take the money. Well, Ronaldo. Well, a few people did, <laughs> but Ronaldo took the money for sure. But they offered Mbappe seven hundred and seventy-six million dollars for one year. He could have actually went back to play in Europe after that year was over. Um. And he declined that money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, all right. 
this is extremely interesting on a few different levels. Mm -hmm. um, as you, the key is the country's public investment fund. Yes. So this, then when you see like how they have this type of money, how did like I was talking to my son and he was saying like, who's paying for this? Like who's doing this? So, the country's public investment fund, right? So now it goes back to rebranding the country. Yep. And Saudi Arabia has traditionally had a stigma that was not friendly to foreigners, right? Very religious country, very um, strict country, no alcohol, no nightclubs, different things that, you know, people, especially in Western society, um, deem as entertainment, mm -hmm. um, not allowed in Saudi Arabia. But they understand that the future of oil can only live for so long. So they've already been diversifying their portfolio for a long period of time from investing to real estate to a variety of different things. But I think, um, you know, watching Dubai rebrand itself or they never even had a brand Dubai, but, you know, building itself as a tourism capital of the world and seeing that you know, that's their next door neighbor. Mm -hmm. It gave them the idea. To say, okay, well, if Dubai can do this, let's just sit back and see how this works out for them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have more money than they do. So anything that they can do, we can do at a higher level because we have ultimately a never ending amount of cash available, readily available to us. And what better way to change people's hearts and minds other than entertainment? Mm -hmm. They did a festival last year, music festival last year with DJ Khaled and Future and Roddy, uh, Ross, Joe was there. Um, and then, you know, they're moving into sports. So started with golf, they're merging with the PGA. We'll see if that actually goes through. Uh, and then, you know, football, which is soccer in America, mm -hmm. which is the world's biggest sport, most sport. popular sport. Yeah. And they've made, uh, you know, a lot of inroads and they've been targeting different players at the highest level. And mm -hmm. few, few have taken it. Few have declined. Who, who else has been out there? Who's else been out there for what? I got Swiss Beats. Mm -hmm. Swiss, Swiss lives. He's actually a citizen. We <laughs> talked about that on assets over liabilities. I'm actually, we, we talked about we talked about Saudi Arabia with Swiss Beats and assets over liabilities. Check that episode out right now on, on Wednesday. And he actually spoke his perspective because he actually lives there. He's a citizen. Showed us his driver's license, um, and he had a very unique perspective on Saudi Arabia opportunities and uh, why he's so interested in in. Yeah going out there and he spends a lot of time out there yeah, he has a he has a camel racing team and people thought it was a joke until you realize it's not and there's a lot of money to be made and what we looked at sort of like um the kentucky derby right like where a lot of people are mass around that event a lot of people mass around the the, the camel racing and you you saw him do it when he had his team in saudi it's called saudi bronx shout out to them shout out to mo and everybody over there but He's bringing people every time that there's a big race. You've seen another person go over there. First is Will Smith, then it's Maverick Carter. Mm -hmm. Swiss, is, Swiss is one of those guys, man, very intelligent. And this is something that, you know, shout out to Steve Harvey, but he has a company called Melt, mm -hmm. um, yep. which is dedicated to the Middle East, which is they bring entertainment and different events and different things of nature to the Middle East. And we were lucky enough to get invited to his golf tournament last year, which we actually ended up winning. Job um, well done. Yes. Well, well and done. Uh, that was in Abu Dhabi. So we got to go to the UAE and, you know, made a lot of great relationships over there. And he he actually lives in he, he lives in the UAE. He's actually a citizen of the UAE and he lives out there for uh, part of the year. And um, a lot of people have been relocating and starting businesses and I mean, even being in the UAE. We met forget the celebrities. We met random people. From New York, from <laughs> Chicago, from who different places, out there. Yep. Who lived there, and like I, I'm, I'm like, when you coming back to America, they're like, never. <laughs> For what? Yeah, no plans. Yeah. Never worry. I have 31st. No plans on ever coming back to America, or they come back, you know, just to visit their family, but no plans of like leaving the life that they've established there. And they all said they, they all said one thing. They all said Saudi Arabia is coming. Like Saudi is the move. Like Saudi Arabia is coming. Mm -hmm. They got a war chest full of money. They are coming. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's where we are. Um, and everyone thinks BRICS is a joke. So what do you think? Would you have taken the money? 
Hell yeah. Listen, I'm going to be real with you. Um, if they offer 778 for assets over liabilities, I'm calling uh, whoever at Revolt <laughs> and just text Troy for sure. Hey, bro, 700. I'm sorry. They email me first and I just close the deal. Sorry. Yeah. Forgive me later. Um, hell yeah. The table, 778. <laughs> no question. But he here's a. Um, hey, did we mention that that's tax free? I mean, they probably they would have found a way to tax that. <laughs> Seven hundred and seventy-six for one year. He would. They would have definitely found a way. France would have found a way to tax France. That. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's interesting. We talked about this in twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty-one. Um, if you want to get rich, listen to every episode. There's gems in every episode that you need. Uh, the the fund is fifty-one years old. Um, so to give comparison, Meta's market cap is eight hundred and thirty-four billion. Their fund is seven hundred and seventy-eight billion, and no one talks about their investment fund or Saudi Aramco. And I think because as Americans we have a lens that we were brainwashed to believe that we were the best. They are a formidable opponent. Now, if I was Ice Cube, I'd be on the phone every day to trying to sell Big Three. Okay, great. Adam want to block you out from partnering with the NBA? Take that ish right over to Saudi and go ahead and, and get you two or three billion and call it a day. Um, but I think, like you said, they are trying to, and they're doing a great job of trying to endear themselves to us. And one of the things, like, if you want to win a war, it's a lot easier to win a war from outside and from the people supporting you opposed to trying to merely take it over. Um, I'm really interested to see if Bronny and uh, LeBron get to play together one year, if that next move is not to get LeBron to come over. Because if they offered him 776, will LeBron turn down two and a half to go play overseas in one year? Well, also, too, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, no, let me no, 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 so we shot to my guy. Uh, we did a Combs Court. Um, we did a podcast two days ago. Combo? And, yeah. And he actually asked me that question, and I answered it. And he said that. He was like, you know, do you think that basketball is next? And I said, yeah, I don't see why not. I mean – Basketball is probably the, the next biggest international sport as far as on the radar for people mm -hmm. after after football, soccer. Mm. What? What is the, the number two international sport? Probably cricket. I'm saying oh, for us. Is, for us, cricket is not. It's India is a billion people. That's why cricket is so big. I'm saying across all continents played. When you got basketball, you got Africa, you got yeah. Asia, you got Europe, you got North America. So it's bigger. There's more people that watch the cricket finals, but yeah. that's that's centered in a small area of the world. Gotcha. It's not as widespread. It's not as widespread as basketball. It's not as widespread mm -hmm. as basketball. Debatable. Okay. Okay. So I was like, yeah, I mean, and as far as the star power, it's not that, even no, close. no, that's not even close. So yeah. I was saying that, yeah, I think that um, basketball will probably be the next thing. And Absolutely. I don't, and I, see them offering LeBron a billion dollars to play. Like, let's say, like, this is his last year. Let's say, hypothetically, this is his last year. And, you know, next year he's 39. I think he'll be 39 years old, 40 years old next year. Uh, and they just say, 40, All right, yeah, you damn. know, you, you're done playing in the NBA. Come over here, man. Just have some fun. A, hundred, a billion dollars for one for 35 season. games? Come on. <laughs> so that, that, so that, that was my thing. I'm like, Le I don't know. I don't know if it's LeBron. Right. The, the key is so Ronaldo got 200 million per year for two years. Right. And that's because of his age. Had they offered this to him 10 years ago, yeah. that would have a billion dollar offer. The reason Mbappe is getting the seven, well, got offered the 70, 76, partly is because he's 24 years old. Yeah. The youth is there. Right. Messi got offered 600. So I don't, it would, I, I said the argument to that was well, not even an argument, but like to add to it was like, it would have to be the next NBA star who's like about to hit the peak of his prime. Like if a Zion was healthy or if Jock would, you know, wasn't going through these things like that level of of stardom, like the the future face of it to go over for one year, it would be that equivalent. And then I could see the billion. I think LeBron could get an offer. I don't know if it'll be a billion well, just who, because he's forty. Who would take it is football players. And at some point, we got to have a conversation about how the NFL is running one of the most ruthless business operations ever created. <laughs> so they have a they have a whole thing to to what they're doing with running backs right now is is unbelievable. That's, that's a conversation. So, Saquon Barkley, who is the, the top running back in the league, can't get paid what he's worth because all of the owners are in agreement that they're going to use the running back up for their rookie contract. And then when it's time to pay them, they they're gonna, they they're just going to get a new rookie. And it's a system that yeah. is, is terrible. And these NFL players, particularly running backs, 
like they said, they might as well just get rid of the yeah. position if you don't want to pay them. This is something that this is an economic issue that nobody on these sports shows I've, I haven't heard anybody talking about. Yeah, but um, these players are really getting taken advantage yeah. of, and it's a it's a system. It's obvious what they're doing. Yeah, and they they are literally trying to just burn you out as much as possible for mm -hmm. as little as possible yep. and by the time you actually are up for some real money then they just throwing you away all right now first saquon is not top running back that's just as a fan like he's, he, he's not the top running back no nah, he's, he's not, not one of the top running backs in the league he might be five or six he didn't have a hell of a season last year he's all right he was he was got hurt if when he's healthy, he could be. He can be. That's just yeah, yeah, that's think? all right. Everybody else in life underperforming. <laughs> nah, Nick 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 Chubb is probably the best running back in the league. That's who? just a fact. the person who <laughs> the person who led the NFL in rushing the past two years who plays. Saquon Barkley is one of the best running backs in the league. We're not going to debate sports with me. He's not one of the best running backs in the league. He's a great back. I said that. I just said he's not the top five. He's not top five. Christian McCaffrey's I'm probably putting ahead of him. Christian, Devin. Good. yeah, like Saquon is a beast though. When he's healthy, but he's been hurt, right? No, that's not beside the point. The, the fact is that they so look at his O line, though. Derrick Henry, they actually actually put are trying to put something together where they're like having a running backs commission so they can discuss these problems. The NFL caught one of it, and they're trying to like take action against him. Like, hey, you guys can't have these meetings. The interesting part is like this is true. The highest paid running back in the NFL going into this season is a rookie. Right from from Texas, he was a number eleven pick. He signed his rookie deal. He is now the highest paid running back in the league. He hasn't taken one snap. Whereas a guy like Dalvin Cook, I'll probably put it back ahead of Saquon as well, who was a veteran Pro Bowl player out of Minnesota, is trying to find a job. He can't get a job right now. Mm. Like that's incredible. Right, but the average career of a running back is very short. Yeah, On top of it, it's three to four years. That's what Saudi Arabia should do. They should just start. But, no, but and, I, I was gonna say NFL is only an American game. They try to remember they try to they they keep playing these games in London because the ownership from yeah. Jacksonville is, has ties to London. But I mean, people attend those games. But when people attend, it's like they're fans of every team. It's not like they're there for a specific team. But if you they remember they had the NFL in in Europe and that was a yeah. complete disaster. But so trying if, to spread, but it's an American game. If they're trying to sway public opinion, what's the highest probability? They they buy a couple of NFL teams, a couple of NBA teams, or they outright buy Disney. Disney's market cap is only one fifty seven. This is the honest conversation that we need. Like while everyone's focused mm. on if Cardi and Offset that song Fire, by the way, that y'all put out, shout to y'all. If that yeah. song works, and what Drake said about Pharrell's jury on meltdown. I don't know who made me <laughs> upset, but leave the boy alone. Y'all scared to come to the six? We'll be there soon. Not us. We, we have family and friends there. You mean, but what if the Saudi investment fund decides to say, okay, great. Let's go ahead and buy Disney. They have 778 under management. That would be one of the best acquisitions of all time. And let's argue it. Disney is not what it should be, and it would probably be better run. If I was sitting on that board, it's either them get a, a couple NFL teams or infiltrate the NBA. Is it is it the, that, is it the that, NFL teams or because I could I could see them bringing Formula One. That's that's it. Formula One, but it, it's impossible for them. It, the, the Disney thing is impossible. I agree. L very low probability, right? Well, because it's like from the direction that Disney is going in. As far as social stances and different things of that nature, Saudi Arabia didn't even let they didn't even allow Spider Man to be shown in their country. Mm -hmm. uh, the Spider Verse joint. Yeah, but if you buy it, you can change the rules there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I just said the culture <laughs> would be completely changed. It, it, I don't see that happening. <laughs> see that These happening. are things we got to consider. Listen, two years ago, I think it would have been impossible for them to have outright bought the PGA. Yeah. But those are, that's a global sport where you can have courses, right? So if you buy an NFL team, it's not like you can just, hey, we're going to build a stadium and have them play here. Okay. It's just, it logistically, I mean, it's uh, 13 hours away. That's that's just tough. Even from a viewing standpoint, I it agree. was like the World Cup. It was tough for people to watch just because of the time difference. But something that is like, like I said, like a Formula One where the U, like Abu Dhabi so has that. Yeah. It has a, a final race at, in Abu Dhabi. I feel like even that because that will that brings people like that's a big event. They can do things like that. 
We're, all all yeah, build yeah. like what they're doing now. Build a soccer, building soccer leagues. We're gonna, we're gonna go. We gotta, we gotta investigate the situation. We gotta go to Ryder. Yeah. Ryder, we on the way. Yeah, Ryder. Yeah, Ryder. Cup? No, no, Ryder. That's the city that we are. Yeah, Riyadh, I'm sorry. No, he told when I when Swiss, I said, yo, I said Riyadh. He said no, it's Ryder. That's what Swiss said. Monitor the situation on what the Saudis <laughs> are gonna do. If you if see it, it was then, me, I would either try and acquire a team. Have a team either come to build a league there or make a play for an America. They may not be able to get this and they can swipe up Roku for nothing, though. We will be in Saudi Arabia, ladies and gentlemen. If you see Market Mondays from <laughs> Saudi, don't ask any questions. And if the investment fund wants to buy the show, it is for sale. For give sure. Me, give me 400 million up front. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Have at it. It's been cool. real. It's guaranteed. It's been real. <laughs> um, all right. Before we leave, before we end this show, let's talk about some crypto if we can. So, um, do you believe Bitcoin will drop under 15,000 before having? Um, a, a few people have asked me this, and I think this is a great question that got sent to me from somebody from Stock Club. Um, under 15. That's gonna be, I think that has like a probability of less than if it does drop below 15, it, it's gonna be because of other reasons and not just having it alone. And now do your homework. How far shout out to J May? How far does Bitcoin drop after halving? If it does go that low, it's gonna be because funds have active shorts on it to make it go down so that they can buy it at a lower price but since they're trying to get these etfs off it's going to be really hard to do that i don't know if it goes as low as 15 um or below that but i think it it may touch 17 18 again but 15 seems a little bit rough if so i will load the boat and hold it for four or five years um year of year return for bitcoin and if you're looking at like half of the decade bitcoin return is like outpacing everyone for sure including nvidia apple microsoft etc um, but i don't think it'll drop that far Okay, and crypto millionaire is found dead in Argentina. This this is getting scary. Um, it's too many people in that crypto space who are going missing. Um, a lot of times you have to kind of move quiet. For anyone that is huge on crypto, um, I would just say make sure you don't set, say anything that upset the powers that be. Leave the banks out of it. Even like the all when I was going pushing back against decentralization, they won't allow that. Like, so if we know f people that we grew up with in a neighborhood that are killed over a hundred thousand, what do you think that they're willing to do over billions of dollars? Be clear, be mindful. You can be an advocate of an asset, but once you start talking about the banks and banking structure and taking up, it's scary. It, it, it's really scary to see this. And in all of these cases of the crypto millionaires who have been found dead. The investigations have stopped very quickly after the news was reported. Please be careful out there. Be mindful. Be mindful, y'all. Um, all right. Well, another episode. Speaking of crypto, Michael Novogratz, billionaire, will be at InvestFest. This is true. Yes. yes. Ian, my brother, we will we will do Dead or Alive. I know people have asked. Are we we, we going to save that? Yeah. We, no, I'm saying we're not going to do it today. I'm okay. going to say we're going to save it because there's a few companies that I, uh, I want to talk about. Okay. Before, we, we can't go without acknowledging this week of earnings. We must. Okay. We must. Right? Like, there are certain earnings that we have to talk about. Uh, and so let's start with Tuesday. We got AMD reporting. Uh, we talk about them a lot here on Market Monday. Exactly. Starbucks will be reporting. Wednesday, we got PayPal and Shopify, amongst others. But some these are just ones that we talked about. And then Thursday is the big day. Thursday is the big day. Amazon will be reporting. And <laughs> Apple will also be reporting on Thursday. My baby. I want you to pay attention to something. And, and I, I was watching it. And a lot of analysts are looking. Like a lot of these companies, and we saw last week with Meta reporting. We saw Google and Microsoft. They're talking about AI, but they're not saying AI in some of their reports. Mm -hmm. The word that they're saying is CapEx. Mm -hmm. And so I want people to pay attention to that word inside of uh, Amazon's reporting and Apple's reporting when they talk about CapEx, capital expenditures, where they're going to be spending their money in for their future quarters. Pay attention to those two things. Thursday's a big day, Amazon, Apple. Yeah, I love Amazon. I uh, told us a stock club two weeks ago. Because um, someone asked me, like, what's one of the reasons that you love Amazon as a long-term holding? I was like, okay, imagine if I told you there's a company on Earth that generates a billion dollars a day. 
what you want to be invested in. They was like, yeah, I was like, that's Amazon. They have so much market share in comparison to where you buy from. Like most people are thinking to go to Amazon first. They are literally grossing a billion dollars a day in sales. Yeah, I think still underappreciated as a stock. Oh, absolutely, a yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, well, yep. What do we know? I mean, Microsoft does five hundred and thirty-four million a day, and Microsoft is where it is. Uh, I get the margins are different because they're in different businesses, but it's really hard to argue with a business that's bringing them yeah. a billion dollars a day, and, and their margins are like twelve or thirteen percent. Like that's a gigantic, monstrous number. So it is. What, what do you think? Months. If Bessie's not the, the CEO and Bezos is the CEO, what you think the number looks different? Uh, they, they would have had a year like Apple and Microsoft. Okay. I, I was absolutely. Yeah. I'm kind of thinking the same. Okay. L- listen, his Latino wife won't let him come off that super yacht. <laughs> but I'm telling you, if they put Bezos back in that seat and do like what the Lakers did and brought Phil back, Amazon is going to take off. I think maybe just for two years, they need to do what Disney did and, and bring Hefe back, let him wear his little shirt. You know, to be on Playa <laughs> Jeff vibes, and and, and run, run the ship for a couple of years, but um, yeah, and maybe soon we can have your guy come on and talk to, us yeah, about what oh, absolutely, Bezos investing in the Bezos, the Bezos, Bezos Foundation. Well, let's let's get it done. Yes, another glorious market Mondays. Happy belated birthday to my mom. Happy birthday, happy birthday. And, um, also happy anniversary to my brother and his uh. Wow. His wife, uh, Simone. Happy anniversary. Happy, happy anniversary. I think it's 17 years. 17? Wow, that's amazing. Wow. That's so, incredible. Uh, and yeah. this is this is my mom's birthday week. So, ha- mom, I know you're watching. Happy birthday. Happy, happy, happy birthday. birthday, mom. Leo season. Happy Absolutely. Birthday. Sure. So, yeah, this is one of those ones, man. And Bape, I still don't understand why he didn't take that money. Though. 776. I, no. My I, my daughter looked me in my eyes. She said, "Daddy, you should take that. If that was you, you should take that." I said, "Don't worry. I'd have been sending a card saying like, hey, I left. Y'all can come over. I'll send for you. I'll be back in 365.'" And all of the all of the people of <laughs> oh, he, it, it was blood money. You Fran, you know what France has done to the no, world? Absolutely. <laughs> They're still how- getting royalty to <laughs> perpetuity off of yeah. that. What? France is one of the worst places with historical genocide to this day of Africa and black people. So please save me. Save me the blood money sob, sob story. Not interested in hearing it. Saudi Arabia we're on our way. <laughs> Three, four hundred. As a fact. Can, can we reach out to Bob? I, 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 I mean, it's, it, that was the question. They Hey, shout out to Combo. He's like, yo, if somebody offers y'all 776 for earn your leisure, I said, yeah, our leisure's been earned. I'm t- listen, if we get offered <laughs> 600 for rent, y'all can take the deal without my permission. Good night. Just wire the money. It's been I'll leave it dirt you. Go ahead. It's been real. I, l- I love y'all. Let me count the ways. Dykeman, this Wednesday, 8 Pull o'clock. Up. Pull up on us. Big, big game. We might have, we might have some surprises. You never know. Never know. <laughs> right now. You never know. Get you your never, bag ready. You never know what can happen <laughs> right now. You never know what can happen. Get your bag ready. Houston. Oh, we will actually be in Houston this week, actually. That's um, a fact. Uh, what day? Thursday. Thursday. We're, we're, in, we're speaking at uh, a real estate event. Yes. N-A-R-E-B. Shout out to uh, them. National Conference. Thank you for having us in Toronto. And we're going to be there with our brother. MG the mortgage guy will be there. <laughs> that uh, should be fun. That's Toronto, be fun. Canada. Yes. Today has come. You guys showed us so much love. Back to back, sold out shows, Caravana. This is this is on us. We just gonna do something just for love. We will be up there all weekend for this weekend. Caravana. I haven't been back. I was in Caravana way before Drake was popping. So why are you saying I? It happened. We were both there. <laughs> like I don't understand but, how. But then you, I went without you too. Though. You after we after you were there, we were there together. Then you twice we were there together. Then you went back another time. That's a fact. But I was there before you even knew about it. So <sighs> this is my first time back <laughs> in, in a while. It's been years, a while. Probably eighteen years. Eighteen. Yeah, when you say these numbers, it's so scary. But you're it's right. Crazy, so bro. Eighteen years ago, we was in Canada. But Caravan is my first time back. Well, no, we was back for. This year, obviously, for the event. Yes. But yes. Uh, first time back for Caravana. So we will put that picture up, the throwback. That'd be dope. We will be there for all <laughs> look, 17 years ago. 
this is the crazy thing because I was looking at even the photos of the wedding, and um, damn, I was shooting 90% 18 years ago, and I'm still shooting 90% now. <laughs> Hello, and one from, from, from the field, check the track record from the field before a deal, before a deal, <laughs> before a deal, independent <laughs> out the trunk, master <laughs> thing. <laughs> Huh. Make him say, huh? Hand to hand. <laughs> the combat. And Kitchener. Or <laughs> terrorist. Combat. Playing at the highest level. Before international players? Boy. Yo. Huh. Huh. That's funny. Check the film. Um, <laughs> check the film. So, yes. Toronto pull up on us all weekend, man. Love is love. M2M. At the whole. At the whole. My guys. My Tom guys. Bro. Yes, Bros. Sweetie, team, what up? Man. Damn, um, what up? Then Monday, Monday, we got the event. Ernie Alicia will be there. Ian Dunlap will be there. And 19 Keys will be there. And all of our friends from Canada will be there. This free event, just RSVP. Link on the link in the website. Um, space is limited, so make sure you RSVP. Please do early. that. Please do that. 19 Keys will be in the building. He said he's going to retrain. He's going to change his whole travel plans to come up there. So can't miss it. <laughs> I can't miss that. <laughs> Can't miss that, man. But uh, thank you guys for rocking with us. We'll see you tomorrow, actually. Yes. Uh, dope episode of Early Leisure, Calais Campbell. And um, oh, two more you. stocks that I like before we close out Costco is still doing incredibly amazing. And on the industrial side, John Deere is still doing amazing. Solid. Go to Salad. John Deere. Go to Salad. John Deere. It they is. They plowed a field too, ain't it? Next week. Shout next, out to Rick, hey. Rick Ross. Is, he, 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 he caught a leg. He, he, he caught a leg. Yeah. Ian, next week we'll, we'll we'll talk about this one I sent you. He's spending money yes. at an unprecedented yeah, rate yeah. right now. We'll give him something to add to the watch list. Rick Ross bought a thirty-six million dollar mansion, fourteen million dollar watch, and no, a private twenty million dollar and watch. a private plane in one week. Yeah, because he was bragging <laughs> that the watch was more than the Floyd joint. No, I think I think he unloaded his wings his wing stop portfolio. He caught a lick. He he, he had a liquidation event. <laughs> <laughs> that's what life is about. Say you had a liquidation of it without saying you had a liquidation of it. That's a lot of money. He, he hasn't announced that publicly, but I, all it, signs are pointing. All to signs that. point yeah. to a liquidation of it. How, how long did the whole wing stop? Probably eight, eight, nine years. Longer than that. I would say like maybe 12. What that long? Yeah, yeah you went to like 2010. 10, maybe, yeah. Yeah. She thinking for leak. I'm thinking, thinking wing stop. And that was 2008. Oh, it's got the liquid. Hey. Come, on, come on, EYL, and talk about it, man. That Ross, you've, be been very, you've been very secretive about this, but Sweet. I have a strong suspicion that a hundred million dollar liquidation event to <laughs> or more, perhaps or more. Suspicious. Star Island, yeah. that's that's tough, man. That's, and he yeah. already has a house in Miami. He yeah. bought a Mari Stoudemire's house for eighteen million a couple years ago. No, no, that he got on. Well, he got he did another. He got that for like three because it was on Mari Stoudemire's yeah, house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's a crazy. This house is incredible. The Star Island play. Oh, oh. Stop it! It cost some coin to be over there, boy. <laughs> that that's that's. I mean, he yeah, got the promise plan. He got no that. Fixer uppers up over there. Nah, and bro. He, and he brought Meek Mill's crib just just cause. Just yeah, because he couldn't sell it. Is a million? No, he put it for four million dollars. It was four? Yeah, yeah, it was he, four. I thought he gave him a mill. No, he four, no, it was four he, piece. He couldn't sell it. He was trying to sell it for two years. <laughs> but can we talk about that kind of proximity? It does drive you to like do more. Like uh, remember when we said in LA, he was playing me the voice note from Diddy. It was just like his energy was like so infectious. And I'm like, Diddy been killing since '94. Yeah. Like proximity does matter. A lot of the times, like same in, in your personal life, like in business, who you surround yourself with matters so much. I'm not doing this as a pitch for Market Mondays in Ghana or Invest Fest, but I'm telling you, like, sometimes you need, a, like, a, a great player will go to a better team to have better synergy with a player and a coach. If you have not hit the marks that you need to hit financially, you got to get a better team. Yeah. You got to get a better I don't know how you guys cannot be around this stuff and, and hear it and not be inspired. I know sometimes people feel like this is being said to brag, but, like, I'm in all too. Like to hear 34, 12, 20, it's like I got more work to do. That's like an NBA stat, 34. Yeah, 12, 20. like what? That's a hell of a week. It's like LeBron. That's a hell of a week. That's different. Uh, yeah. That's different. It's having the best. Yeah, week like ever. Slim Duck out here, he did uh 13 days of cars, like seeing how Slim been investing. Now I'm about to help him out. Like, yo, be around people who inspire you. 
That's a fact. Shout out to Slim Thug. Boss sure. Hog. The Boss Hog. All right, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Namaste. It's been real. Love, y'all. Love, love, love. Take Toronto. Care. Peace. What's the deal? Peace. Drake, holla at me. <laughs> <laughs>